Please welcome Don Winter, Chair of the National Academy of Engineering. Good afternoon. I am pleased to welcome all of our members and guests to the NAE's national meeting. As with last year's meeting, we are most pleased to be able to have an in-person meeting as we continue to learn with COVID. It was not too long ago that the COVID pandemic threatened the world as the virus spread seemingly without control. Our ability to transcend that threat was due in no small part to the incredibly rapid development, production, and distribution of highly effective vaccines. It should be noted that engineers and engineering processes played a very significant role in that campaign. Today, much of Europe faces a very different threat due to Russia's immoral and brutal invasion of Ukraine. Russia's attack in Ukraine date back to 2014 with their taking of Crimea, violating their own commitments to Ukraine's territorial integrity made 20 years prior. When their latest hostilities uh, with the latest uh, escalation of hostilities, the so-called special military operation of last February, was effectively countered by Ukrainian forces, Russia adopted a strategy of terrorism against the civilian population of Ukraine, targeting residential areas and Ukraine's energy infrastructure. The impact of Russia's attacks goes way beyond the borders of Ukraine. Other nations that were formerly part of the Soviet Union, such as Moldova, Georgia, Latvia, and Lithuania, are fearful of Putin's apparent desire to reconstruct a Russian empire. Other European nations, such as Poland, are fearful of being on the front line as they were in 1939. Somewhat unexpectedly, at least to Putin, the European nations have rallied in support of Ukraine, providing both humanitarian and military aid and participating in sanctions against Russia. Now, Putin has responded by cutting off gas supplies to those nations. The potential of a cold winter without the ability to heat homes and fuel industry has been particularly threatening to Germany, which has become dependent on Russian gas. Fortunately, Germany's industry rose to the challenge. In less than a year, an LNG terminal was designed, built, and put into operation at Wilhelmshaven in Germany. This in a country known more typically for infrastructure developments that take multiple decades. I will just note the new Berlin airport that opened in 2020, just nine years after originally scheduled, and a new railway station in Stuttgart scheduled to open in 2025 after 15 years of construction. Now, an old saying going back to Plato is that necessity is the mother of invention. Arguably, both the development of COVID vaccines and the construction of the Wilhelmshaven LNG terminal are examples of such behavior. In both cases, old technologies and processes were successfully challenged to meet critical needs without compromising the integrity of the final products. If only such behavior could be expanded to address other challenges. Europe's energy infrastructure will need further development to ensure the availability of sources of supply. And Ukraine's infrastructure will need to be rebuilt. 
to house the residents and support the redevelopment of the country. And globally, the development of a resilient energy infrastructure that is both friendly to the planet and its inhabitants awaits. These are some of the challenges for the future. Challenges perhaps for many of the young prospective engineers in the audience here today. To you, I say, take on these challenges. Study hard and learn your craft. But then, be bold and be willing to innovate. Do not let the challenges evident today become the crises of tomorrow. The world of the future will be what you make it. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce John Anderson, the president of the NAE, for his remarks. John? Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2023 National Meeting of the National Academy of Engineering. We call it the NAE. Our theme today is touching every corner of our lives. We are pleased to have our NAE members and guests who have taken the time to join us today, both in person and virtually, with us. So I, I ask the members of the National Academy of Engineering and their guests to please stand so we can acknowledge them. Now, I told them to be careful because the young people in the audience ask tough questions. So I said, let the other people answer them first before you venture in, because it gets difficult. An enthusiastic welcome to the many students joining us today. You are the future of engineering, the future. And it is our pleasure to share with you the value, power, creativeness, and excitement of engineering. I extend a sincere thanks to the two high schools that are here, and I'm gonna acknowledge each high school, but the goal when I call your name, I would like the students in that high school to stand and make as much noise as you can, <laughs> all right? So I'm gonna start, I'll do it alphabetically, Cabrillo High School from Long Beach. Could, be, could, be, could barely hear you. Okay. And, and the students from Samueli Academy in Santa Ana. Okay. And I know you've come to arm with questions for our speakers today. I'd also like to acknowledge the, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the teachers that are here and counselors from both schools. Thank you very much. If you would stand, the teachers and, uh, uh, what do you say? <laughs> As you grow older, students, you will find out that this teacher is the most important persons in your life outside your family. This afternoon, we are fortunate to have with us four distinguished engineers who were selected by NAE from among participants at the Granger Foundation Frontiers of Engineering Symposium as the 2023 Lillian Gilbreth Lectures. Lectures. The Gilbreth Lectures recognize outstanding early career engineers who are especially gifted in the presentation of their engineering ideas. And I emphasize the word presentation because you can learn a lot just by watching these people give a talk. Launched in 2001, the Gilbreth Lectures are funded by the Armstrong Endowment for Young Engineers, which was established by NAE member and former IBM executive John Armstrong. 
The Gilbreth Lectures are named in honor of Lillian M. Gilbreth, a pioneer in the field of management theory who is best known for her work in industrial engineering. But Lillian Gilbreth was much more than that. In fact, to say Lillian Gilbreth is a remarkable person is an understatement. Let me share with you a few facts about the remarkable woman Lillian Gilbreth. She received her bachelor's degree in English literature in 1900, followed by a master's degree in 1902 from the University of California, Berkeley. She completed her PhD in psychology from Brown University, achievements quite remarkable for the time, especially for a woman. By the way, at that time, women did not have the right to vote. That tells you how long ago that was. This is not your typical engineering background. No degree in what we call engineering, but you turn out to be one of the most remarkable and best engineers the country had to offer. She, along with her husband, engineer and inventor Frank Gilbreth, formed a formidable research and development team. Lillian's training in psychology easily transferred to time and motion studies. And through research, often involving their 12 children, she demonstrated how companies and industries could improve their management techniques, efficiency, and productivity. Lillian's husband passed away early on, very young man, and she found herself a widow. So think about this for a moment. In terms of the times, it's 1924, she holds a PhD, she's 46 years old, and she's so suddenly a widow with 12 children. Remarkably, Lillian found the fortitude and pers perseverance to continue along her path as both a professional and a mother. For more than 40 years, Lillian's career combined psychology with the study of scientific management and engineering. She broke new ground in the area of assistance to the disabled. And among other achievements, she designed the layout of an ideal kitchen for a person with a heart condition. In 1935, Lillian became a professor of management at Purdue's School of Mechanical Engineering. So think about those degrees, and then she's a professor of mechanical engineering. And she became the country's first engineering, female engineering professor. Today, she is acknowledged as the founder of the field of industrial engineering. And Lillian Gilbreth was the first woman elected to the National Academy of Engineering. She was elected in 1965, one year after the founding of the Academy. Lillian and her husband Frank and their time in motion research are memorialized in the subjects of the book and subsequent movies, Cheaper by the Dozen. Her, two of her children wrote that book, and then the follow-up book, Bells on Their Toes. So we honor Lillian Gilbreth for her perseverance, her fortitude, and pioneering spirit. She shows us that engineering opportunities are as unique as the individual and can be tailored to your individual interests and passions. Today's Gilbreth lectures highlight the myriad disciplines of engineering and the diverse opportunities within engineering, from design of space systems, to prevention of infections, to 3D printing, to decarbonization. Engineering offers something for everyone. There will be a little time for questions and answers after each lecture. Please feel free to ask questions. In fact, it's a requirement here. Your teachers expect you to ask questions. So th start thinking now of the questions. This is your opportunity to find a spark that ignites your interest. And with that, I invite Dr. Al Romig, NAE's Chief Executive Officer, to the stage for, our, for a call to action. What a great time to be an engineer. Roll it.
Engineers are working to solve the biggest challenges we face on Earth, from climate change to pandemics to space travel and everything in between. Engineering requires big thinkers and people that are creative, passionate, and are willing to persevere, like all of you in this room. I could tell at lunch. That video is our sounding call to rise to these challenges. And to do this, we have to make sure that we understand how engineering fits into our social fabric. How does it fit culturally, ethically, et cetera, and environmentally into the world in which we live? But it's clear that we must create an engineering field that is more open, inclusive, diverse, and accepting of all individuals. We must open doors to underrepresented groups and instill in all individuals the possibilities and opportunities to do engineering. We are in a very competitive world, very competitive. And it's gonna take all of us working together to persevere and keep the great country that we have. By increasing the, uh, the engineering talent through a commitment to equity and inclusion, instilling a culture of ethical and environmental responsibility in engineering, and improving capabilities and competencies for complex systems engineering, we can achieve this goal. That is our call to action. And I hope you enjoy the day. And at the end, I will stand between you and the snacks. So, John. Thank you, Al. We have an exciting lineup of interesting topics by exceptional professionals. You can find their bios in the printed program and on the NAE website. But I'll uh, provide a brief overview of each as I introduce each one of them. Let's begin. It's an honor to introduce our first Gilbreth lecturer, Mr. Bo Nas. Bo is a senior technical engineer at NASA where he, is currently, where he currently leads NASA's agency-level rendezvous and capture system capability leadership team. While his most recent studies duties are directed towards agency-level strategy, mission systems engineering, and project management, his background is in spacecraft guidance, navigation, and control. Bo was the flight dynamics lead for the Hubble Robotic Servicing and Door uh, Durbit mission in early 2000s and later the principal investigator for the relative navigation system experiment on Hubble servicing mission four. Today, Bo will walk us through the design of space systems to enable in, in space assembly and servicing. Please join me in welcoming Bo Nas. Bo. <laughs> Well, thank you, NAE, for having me here. Uh, such, an, such an honor. And um, I'm in awe of the brain power in this room. Um, congratulations to all of us for being here. So I work for NASA, so that means I have to have seven acronyms in my title. There's a laser pointer. Great. So I'm the ISAM and RPOC system capability lead. So ISAM is kind of going to be the main focus of our conversation today, in space servicing, assembly, I almost forgot my own title, in space servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. So these are operations in space. So let's talk about exactly what that means. So um, most spacecraft missions have a pretty linear, simple flow. We study and develop and fabricate and test, and we spend sometimes decades doing that for a spacecraft. We launch a spacecraft over the course of a, you know, a few hours, a week-long campaign. We check it out and make sure it's working. And then we operate it for as long as we can before something fails on it. And usually, we design our spacecraft to operate for a minimum of five years, but they often operate for 25 years or more. And often, the thing that it results in us finally turning them off is that they run out of fuel. So we're talking about multi-billion dollar spacecraft. Uh, and a lot of times, at the end of their life, they run out of fuel, so we turn them off. So, um, and then, of course, we decommission them. So, so my, my kind of role is to try and think of another way um, to be a little bit more flexible and, and maybe a little bit more sustainable. And so we'll talk about those options to do that. So we have servicing. Um, servicing is the boxes in green here. If we 
incorporate some multiple launch and some rendezvous proc stops in capture. I'm sorry about all the acronyms, but you'll get used to it if you're an engineer. Uh, robotics, so if we enable those things, then we can do some interesting things in end of life. We can use spacecraft to go up and dock and relocate. We can refuel them. Uh, we can inspect them and figure out what's wrong with them. We can remove or dispose of them, which, which is a, a pretty interesting topic these days as we talk about the orbital debris environment. Uh, so we add some more cross-cutting thinking, these gray, these gray boxes. So if, if we actually plan from the start to design in the ability to service spacecraft, and we plan from the start to plan for more multiple launches, then we add some really interesting new things that we can do. We can fuel so launch tanks empty and get more on orbit. We can use robotics to aid deployments more reliable, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we bring up James Webb. Uh, we can upgrade, maintain, replace, and repair. So, you know, you, you wouldn't buy a computer if you couldn't, well, actually, holy smokes, I just dated myself. I was gonna say you wouldn't buy a computer if you couldn't take out a component and put a new one in, but actually, you really can't do that anymore, can you? <laughs> uh, and, uh, Okay, and so then if you can bring things back, so you go launch, launch a second time and catch it and bring it back, you can refurbish it and refly it, and we actually do that. I'll talk about a couple of missions that we do that on, not very many of them. Next, we add assembly, so you can assemble things in orbit. I won't get into too much detail there, but um, you know, maybe the most interesting is assemble huge precision apertures, and we'll come back to that idea a little bit later. And now you can also do manufacturing in space, so if you, if you uh, if you have materials in space, you can manufacture large infrastructure, use that to assemble things in space and operate vehicles. You can manufacture goods in space for Earth use, and there's a lot of people working that. You can manufacture parts and use them for replacement in space. And you can recycle, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe use, use material that's already up there um, <clears throat> to, to build new things in space. And a lot of interest in that for things like Mars exploration, where humans might be gone for several years. They can't take all their spare parts with them. They just can't afford the mass, and so maybe they produce them on the way when they need them. So a lot of interest, in, interest there, and I think we're going to hear some more about additive manufacturing later. Um, we're counting on you. Uh, interoperability is just something, you know, you add standards in the beginning. That means everybody can use the same things. So there's a lot of talk about interoperability, especially on the lunar surface as we go back to the moon. We want to be, be able to stay there. and. Um, maybe we want to make sure the things that land there have interchangeable parts in case one's batteries die. You can take one batteries out and plug them in the other. It seems like a no-brainer, right? But we don't do that in space yet. And then a, a, another really interesting kind of parallel activity that I don't lead but I'm very interested in is in situ resource utilization. This is mining regolith on the moon or other planets, asteroids, comets. Um, we can generate fuel, hydrogen, oxygen from water. Um, and of course, we also probably will need to maintain those systems. They're going to be similar to big tractors uh, and, and construction equipment. And mean time to failure on those things is, I'm told, well, they, they, they operate them something like 20 hours a day. I'm making that number up. And then they have preventative maintenance four hours a day on those things. So they're repairing them every day on those large mining equipment. We, we, we obviously do not do that on the moon right now. We don't do anything on the moon right now. So. Okay, so that's what, that's what servicing assembly and manufacturing is. So let's talk a little bit about why. So everybody knows about Hubble, right? Well, so this is the first picture, or, or, or the early pictures of Hubble after it launched. Servicing mission one put a, put a corrective optic in, made it look like that. So we all know that Hubble was saved by servicing, okay? Maybe what we don't realize, oh, so here, this is, the, this is that, pic, that camera that took that picture. So this is servicing mission one, astronaut installed, uh, let's see, astronaut Jeffrey Hoffman installed that instrument in Hubble. Okay, so to, and, and, and took that great picture and lots of great pictures after that. That's the wide field planetary camera. Okay, so we know that, they, that it was saved in the first mission. What a lot of us probably don't know is that we went back to Hubble several times and the reason Hubble was, is such a remarkable machine is that we went back to it five times we replaced a lot of equipment on Hubble, but most importantly, we put new instruments on Hubble. So the instruments are what or where the magic is. That's why we fly it. The, uh, the optics, a 2.4 meter mirror, that do technology doesn't change very fast, but cameras change very fast. And so every time we went back, we put a new instrument on. You can see I put a, I'm an engineer, I had to put a plot in. 
so this is a, a, a way of um, understanding how much impact Hubble has had. So this is the science metrics. It's a unit that we can talk about later if you want offline, but I won't get into it. It's a measure of how, much, how productive a mission is. These are several NASA missions, and you can see Hubble, this black line, going up. And of course, every time it peaked was after a new instrument was installed. So if you think about this, the, over the life of Hubble, I think $16 billion was the cost of the life of Hubble, about 10 billion of that for the launch. So the, the 10 billion gets us to here, okay? And then 6 billion gets us to here. All right, so that's the value of servicing. It's very clear for exquisite national assets that upgrading them is a good thing. Okay, so what came after Hubble? Y'all have seen the James Webb pictures, and these are phenomenal pictures. And this is a extremely challenging mission. I can't tell you how hard this mission is. Um, they had to fit this large segmented mirror telescope into a launch vehicle. Launch vehicle fairings are five meters, the bigger ones now. We've got some bigger ones coming. But they had to pack this thing into a really compact space, get it out a, a million miles from Earth, and operated out there. Once we launched it, nobody was ever going to see or touch it again. Okay, which is true for most spacecraft, actually. Hubble's, a, Hubble's kind of an anomaly. So as this movie plays, you'll see something like 150 mechanisms deploying. Every single one of them, single, a, a single point failure. Meaning if it didn't work, the mission was over. The mission was failed. Um, so uh, as a servicing guy, well, I'll tell you, almost all engineers that watched this were extremely nervous. But as a servicing guy, I was super nervous because I knew that if those things didn't work, I was going to get a call. And frankly, I didn't know how to, do, how to fix that telescope. It wasn't built to be fixed. But of course, we would try something, right? So I didn't get a call, as you all know. Uh, and, and, and Webb has just been producing some awesome pictures. So uh, why a symbol? So, we talked about why servicing on Hubble was great, so why should we assemble? Um, of course, it's for big science, right? These kind of things need to be big. You can't launch them. Um, there, this is actually a, a concept called Louvoir. That's the biggest uh, deployable telescope we could possibly launch. It would fit in an SLS, eight meter fairing, I think. Um, lots of folds similar to James Webb. Um, but so this, this concept um, is intended to answer the question, are we alone? And, and NASA has recently um, just announced that they're going to call this next thing. It won't look like this. It'll be, it'll be closer to this size. Um, but they're going to call it the Habitable Worlds Observatory. And the point of that spacecraft will be to, um, it, to, to do spectroscopy on the reflected light of planets, extrasolar planets around stars. So I have another, I have another plot here for you. This is exo-Earth candidate yield. This is the number of planets that we think we could find an image, do spectroscopy on. And spectro spectroscopy means figure out what gases are in the atmosphere of that extrasolar planet. So if we see there are certain lines in the spectrum that we only see emanating from Earth, they're the lifelines in the spectrum. And if we see those spectra, it's an indication that there might be life on that planet. So the number of candidate planets we can look at is a function of how, how far away they are, how many stars there are nearby. And the number we can see is, is, uh, it has this relationship with the diameter of that primary mirror. So if you look here, uh, this is James Webb. Hubble's down here. Sorry, this is James Webb. Um, the Habitable Worlds Observatory will probably be in this range, which means we're going to have the opportunity to see something like 30. So that's not very many. But we're going to look at 30 stars and, and, and look at their planets that are in the habitable zone um, where there might be life, and we'll look at the, the spectroscopy from them. As we get bigger and bigger, we can do more and more, right? So, so bigger is better for, for finding life in the, in the galaxy. So that's why we would assemble. So, so that's where we go to something like this. So the biggest we could possibly deploy, and then there's concepts like this one. This is a 20-meter uh, assembled telescope called ISAT. Uh, you know, very challenging to launch this. Probably something like 12, 10 or 12 launches uh, in, the, in, in that 5-meter fairing. OK, so why else servicing and assembly? Human exploration. Human exploration is the poster child for servicing and assembly. We built Space Station. Uh, I did the count this morning. I, 
I think there was 200, I got it right here, 263 launches, uh, 111 of them crewed to build and maintain and operate the space station. So uh, awesome, awesome um, ongoing international project. Of course, we're doing Artemis now. Uh, you may have seen Artemis 1 just went uncrewed around the moon. Artemis 2 will go crewed around the moon in 24, and then Artemis 3 will rendezvous with Starship uh, in, the, in the NRHO orbit around the moon, in cislunar space around the moon. Um, this Artemis rocket is based on the, the Starship vehicle that I, I, I don't know if anybody's heard yet today. They were supposed to do their first hot, hot fire of 33 engines. This is a game changer, 100 metric tons to low Earth orbit. To get it to the moon, they have to refuel in low Earth orbit, and it takes something like 12 launches of that behemoth rocket. The first one goes up as a tanker, the next 10 launch liquid oxygen and liquid methane and transfer it into that system. The last one goes up and docks. All of the fuel gets transferred into it and they go to the moon, land vertically on the moon and come home. Uh, uh, the crew launch in the capsule and meet, meet twice on the way. So really amazing system, not possible without cryogenic refueling. Gateway will be uh, uh, involved in, in Artemis IV and, and subsequent missions to make serviceable, uh, to make it sustainable and, and enable an extended lunar presence. But it's also to get us going towards Mars. And Mars, uh, Mars starts with the Mars transportation system, which could be a big nuclear system. You can't, you can't launch that. You have to build it in space. So, so they're used to that. So human exploration will do that. And, and, and you know, with a nuke, probably. Interesting. Mars ascent vehicle can't land on Mars with all its fuel, it's too heavy to, to, to survive that landing. They say that Mars has just enough atmosphere to make landing harder. It doesn't really help you much. They do, they do use chutes on Mars, and so they can get slowed down, but there's so much variability that it's just really challenging to land on Mars. Anyway, Mars ascent vehicle will land um, without all of its fuel, will land something beforehand with fuel, will probably drive a rover over to it and refuel and fuel it on the surface of Mars, so, so pretty cool stuff. All right, um, you know, those are the NASA reasons. There are also some other reasons. Department of Defense is very concerned about space becoming a contested um, regime. Um, we're worried about our ability to defend our satellites. We have a, 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 a very strong uh, dominance in space that, that is, has for a long time been assumed to be safe, and that might not be the case anymore. So, you know, you might want to maneuver a lot more in space than we do now. And so... Servicing is a big part of that. There are commercial companies that we'll talk about later, and sustainability. I mentioned I don't I don't particularly like the one billion dollars and then turn it off, or even the cheap disposable spacecraft. I think we're going to get to a point where we buy our car, we drive it halfway across the country, and we fill it with gas instead of just leaving it on the side of the road. So that's the parallel for space right now. All right. So why not servicing and assembly? Um, so there's a chicken and egg problem. Um, we, when we built Hubble, um, we had space shuttle, uh, and, and, and same with International Space Station. These two vehicles were serviceable and assembled and possible because we had a servicer, and it was a, it was an 18-wheeler. It was a heck of an instrument. So we don't have shuttle anymore. So when uh, James Webb was conceived and developed, um, no servicing or assembly was planned because there was no. No Sun Earth L2, that's where, Sun Earth, that's where it goes. It's way, like I said, a million miles. Um, no, no servicer out there, so, and, and, and you know, quite honestly, no, uh, no ability to envision a future where there was a robot. I, I talked to a lot of people that said, why would we make James Webb serviceable? Humans can't go there. And I said, well, why, why do you need humans? And that's what robots are for. Uh, so, so there was no, I, there was no vision for uh, uh, appreciating that there might be robots capable of going out there, um, and and you know I can't really hold it against them. It was an extremely expensive vehicle as is, but the idea of putting a, you know, ten billion dollar spacecraft on a rocket, I if I was there I would not have been able to watch. You know, if I had worked, I mean I wasn't even able to watch not having worked on it, but the risk you take by putting anything on the top of a big rocket is astronomical. So how about maybe splitting it into three pieces, making them simpler to make? Um, as the cost of launches go down, that actually becomes a pretty viable um, risk reduction, which is, which is interesting. You know, I put risk with a question mark here. Um, a lot of folks think that it's too risky to fly up and do prox ops and capture a high value asset. Well, I, frankly, it's not more risky than putting it on the top of a rocket. There's no way. 
Okay, so chicken and egg, what do we do? So uh, OSAM-1, coming to an orbit near you. So NASA's developing this spacecraft called OSAM-1. Um, until about four years ago, I was the technical lead for this activity. It's gonna go capture the Landsat vehicle that was never made to be serviced. Um, you know, chicken and egg. I don't know which one's the chicken and which one's the egg, but we're squashing them both. We're gonna use this spacecraft to refuel something that was never made to be uh, refuelable. So, um, so autonomous rendezvous, autonomous capture, telerobotic refueling and relocation. Here's the spacecraft flying up to uh, Landsat 7. It uses a robot arm to do capture. Uh, we, Landsat 7 is what we call non-prepared or non-cooperative. It wasn't designed to be captured. Uh, so this robot arm has a, has a tool that it uses um, after the, after the propulsion system on the spacecraft flies us into proximity with Landsat 7, we pull out this tool. It's called a Marmon gripper tool. That ring you see is the interface of that spacecraft to the launch vehicle that launched it. Um, so this uh, tool is designed to reach out and grab that Marmon interface. Um, so this is a, a robot arm based on the robot arm, same robot arms that went to Mars. Um, you know, one of the interesting things to me, it's, it's kind of sad to me, but if I, if I asked you how many U.S. built robots there are in space, um, any guesses? Wait, let me make it easier. How many U.S. built robot arms are there in space that aren't on Mars? The answer is zero. Okay, that's a problem. Okay, so we fly up there. This is, a, this is blanketing over the uh, fill and drain valve for Landsat 7. We have a rotary tool that has to cut that blanket to expose the fill and drain valve so we can refuel this thing. We have another tool not shown that pushes it aside. This is, this is uh, wiring to lock these things down. The, the, the fuel in spacecraft is pretty, pretty bad stuff. We don't want it to, people on the ground to get exposed to it, so we put these caps on over the fill and drain valves and we wire them down so that vibration doesn't shake them loose. Uh, then we have an adapter that comes in and takes off this first cap. Uh, of course, um, if you take it off, you gotta be really careful not to accidentally let it go. It'll float away. Uh, so there's a, another cap not shown there um, that has to get removed and then you go back and get a different tool. This is a refueling tool with a hose. And so pull that tool out. It has a quick disconnect on the end uh, that interfaces to that fill and drain valve. Spacecraft, uh, there's probably four or five different fill and drain valve sizes. So we designed this with a quick disconnect on the end. You just change out that thing to service different, um, di different spacecraft. So that screws onto that thing and then it turns to open the valve um, after some leak checks and other things and then we flow the, flow the fuel. Hydrazine, this is a hydrazine system for those of you who are familiar with spacecraft propulsion systems. If it was biprop, it'd be a lot harder. Um, nitrogen tetroxide is not friendly. Uh, and so that's the end of that movie. So we refuel. Uh, uh, in the last five years, we added a second payload called Spider. This is another robot arm uh, built by the folks out at Maxar, formerly uh, the Palo Alto guys. This is assembly of a RF reflector aperture. Um, so a large, a large aperture that couldn't be launched in one piece gets assembled. And then there's a, something called MakerSat. This is going to print, uh, print a 10 meter boom protrusion. That's about all I can tell you about that. I have to get Brian to tell us more about other options. Okay, keep going. This is lights on testing at Goddard. So this is what you do. How you, I mean, how do you figure out how to make this work in space? You, you don't, you, even though you're the servicer, you don't really get a chance to put new hardware on and fix things. So we test, test, test us like crazy on the ground. So this is some testing on the ground. Um, robotic servicing technology is ready. This is the lab where we're doing all that. Here's a mock-up of, of Landsat 7. Um, uh, commercial servicers are here. This is really interesting. Um, when people ask me about how they can afford servicing if they have to build their own servicer or pay for their own servicer, my answer is always, you don't have to build your own servicer. You just pay somebody and you basically borrow their servicer for a few months while they come and refuel your spacecraft and then they go do their business. So uh, commercial industry really critical in this field and we've got to continue to encourage it. So what comes next? We talked about Hubble, we talked about Roman, we didn't, or about James Webb, we didn't really talk about Roman. Uh, it'll launch in 2025. This is a Hubble class mirror, except it's much, much, much bigger um, field of view. I, I have a picture in the back up if you want to see it. And then after that, oh, so Roman is refuelable, so that's good. We can we, we, we put some features on there so that 
it's refuelable, much more, much more friendly than what we're doing on Landsat 7. Um, the National Academies, thank you. Decadal Survey for Astronomy and Astrophysics in 2020 recommended that uh, Habitable Worlds Observatory I told you about, so that'll be in the 40s, and refuelable, modular, and upgradable. So I'm really excited about this. Not excited about how far in the future it is, but I'm really excited about this. This is going back to Hubble ability to upgrade instruments, most likely, most likely robotic, uh, and I would venture to say that some of you in the room will be building and operating that robot. Um, you know, depending on how that Starship work goes, who knows, maybe some of you will be riding that Starship out there and doing this on an EVA. Uh, but for now, I'm working on the robotic aspects. And then after that, um, there's, there's concepts for very large uh, star shades that could be refueled or assembled in space, and we talked about ISAT and big assembled telescopes out there. Um, so some other things that, that are of interest, not just in uh, astrophysics, um, you know, I, I mentioned the Space Force, they're making, they're going to make their fleet serviceable. I don't, I won't be surprised if they have a requirement soon to put refueling requirement on all of their spacecraft. We're going to be upgrading spacecraft, their commercial industry is building tugs, and we're going to do in-space testing, and we maybe we'll do some Earth observation with a persistent platform where you can launch a 100 kilogram instrument every now and then. Instead of replacing the whole platform, you just bring up a new instrument whenever you want. Um, and then, who knows where we go after that? Big, big things, right? Think big. Do good and great things, right? Uh, so, yeah, good and great things. Let's start building. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to what you guys build in space. I can't wait to see it. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for some. Okay, yeah, here's one of them. Okay, and thanks to whoever put the water up here. Well done. Any Anyone questions? Anyone have any questions? I, I was telling Brian that um, I've never given a talk to high school students that I didn't get asked about whether ET is real, so whether there's aliens out there. So. If they raise their hand, the microphone will come to them and we'll alternate. Yes. If, you, if you raise your hand, this is for the students now, okay. you raise your hand, a microphone will approach you and you can then ask the question, okay? There's one over here. Right there. Right behind you. Um, hello, does this work? Okay, my name is Valerie, I'm a junior at um, Cabrillo High School. And my question is, um, when refueling, are the machines coded to know what to do or is it a human controlling it? Well, um, so in the case of Landsat 7, that machine was built 25 years ago, launched 25 years ago. So it has no idea what we're doing to it. Um, it's mainly a mechanical system. So what's the important things that we have to know from that is what's the, you know, we, 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 we push fuel into a pressurized tank against the pressure that's already there. And as the pressure increases, what, what else happens? Do you guys know? What happens to the temperature? It goes up, yeah. So, so we have, you know, that, that spacecraft luckily already has all the things we need in it to monitor the pressure and temperature in that tank. We don't want it to get overpressurized. We don't want it to get too hot. Um, but that data comes down through the ground operators in, in the Mission Operations Center. They monitor the stream from both spacecraft. They make sure that everything is going well. And they command in real time. And if we lose that link to the ground, we stop. We stop flowing. Um, in the future, though, we're, we certainly will build spacecraft that, that can do that automation, can automate that process and monitor it in real time. And in space, usually when spacecraft are having a problem, they just stop because nothing can happen to them. They, they safe themselves, they make sure they're in a stable attitude, and that, that's how we'll operate that as well. Good question. Uh, hello, I'm Jacob Cervantes from Somali Academy. I'm a senior. Um, what would you consider to be the biggest, biggest accomplishment in uh, space machinery? The biggest accomplishment is obviously Space Station. It's the biggest thing that we've built. Um, I mean, 
I'm partial to the James Webb. I think biggest in terms of complexity and performance is that James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the mirrors on that thing, if the mirror was the size of the United States, this is how precisely formed they are. If the mirror was the size of the United States, the bumps on it would be less than 10 centimeters. So that is ridiculously hard. And that thing operates at cryogenic temperatures too, which is just phenomenal. So yeah, I think that's, that's my answer. You guys want to pick or you want me to? <laughs> Uh, my name is Enrique. I am a sophomore for Cabrillo High School. And my question is, how long does it take to ensure the strong and resilient space capabilities of the spacecraft? How long does it take to? To ensure the, uh, how, uh, what's it called? How strong and resilient the space capabilities are of the spacecrafts. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, how do we assure that a spacecraft is gonna work? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, if we're building something we've built before from napkin to launch, the best we can do is about three years. Uh, that's going down as we start to build more small spacecraft. But these big ones, um, you know, say five to 10 years, once the, if the money comes at the right rate. <laughs> um, but of course you get about half of that is design, a little more than half of that is design. And then at the halfway point, you start integrating all of the flight systems together and usually we, do environmental testing on them over the course of a year or more. And that's where we're assuring that what we built works, that we built the right thing and that it works, right? And so we put it in through all kinds of very challenging tests. We put it in a vibration test that, that um, simulates the vibration loads from launch, which is a really not pleasant environment. Um, you know, we're talking tens of G, 10 Gs and, and you know, thousands of Gs of shock events and difficult thermal and vacuum, which by the way, if you have to assemble that James Webb, part of why it was so hard is because not only did it have to deploy to that ridiculously flat and precise performance, but it had to survive launch. So how about this? Let's put it in some styrofoam, not really styrofoam, put the mirrors in some styrofoam, launch them to space, put them together, then they don't have to survive launch. Does that, how much simpler does that make them? So maybe in the future the answer will be a lot less and a lot less challenging, but I think I think that's that's about that answer your question. Great. Hello, my name is Itian Lopez. I'm senior at Samueli. So, you've mentioned that you've spent decades on designs. So here at Samueli, we have experienced what it's like to go from a pre preliminary design review to a complete design review. So my question is. When did you guys just like call it off, say that we're perfectly fine with this design and we want to move forward with whatever is remaining? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the answer is not early enough usually. <laughs> um, yeah, CDR, the critical design is, is usually we're really, really, uh, I don't know what's a, what's a proper word to use. <laughs> we're, we're really defensive of making sure we did it perfectly. But I can also tell you in my experience, once CDR is over, once the critical design phase is over and we start building, a lot changes because we start figuring out what, what we, didn't, we didn't think of. So there's a fine balance between thinking ahead and you gotta think ahead and you gotta do all the analysis that proves it's gonna work. But then you, once you start building it, um, you gotta be flexible and start, and start making those updates. So CDR is kind of about the halfway point. Um, and and you know, um, PDR to CDR for us a year is pretty fast, so it's usually a, a, few, a few years depending on the, the size of, uh, scale of the project. Um, I'm Walter Sevilla from Samueli Academy. I'm a freshman. And would manufacturing or assembly in space cause trash to be produced? Well, certainly everything you produce in space um, would, need to be, would need to factor that in, yes. Um, you know, when we're doing servicing, we uh, often, you know, well, the astronauts on space station in Hubble, for example, they have tether loops that they can connect tethers to the things that are holding in case they let them go because because they'll fly away and that's the end of it. Um, so there there is a there is a concern about that, and it's something we have to factor in in the design. Um, 
So, uh, of course, you know, we can't, we, can't, uh, we can't always prevent it. So there are definitely examples, uh, oops moments, where we lost things in space. Uh, and so certainly we've got to make sure that what we're building is worth that, right? We're doing, we're doing good and great things, not, not putting excess risk out there. Got one down here. Um, my name is Carl Benjamin Bergato, a senior at Cabrillo High School, and um, this is kind of a lingering question of mine, which is the rapid development of AI um, today. And um, I just wanted to ask if there's any applications for AI to be used in assisting these operations in conducting in space assembly? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, AI is a really broad a broad term. The, the most obvious one is computer vision. Um, so, you know, if you want a robot to operate or if you want to do a, a autonomous capture with or without humans on board, you have to have computer vision to enable that system. I have to know where I'm going and that computer vision tells me. There's a lot of other machine learning things that people are talking about. One of the most interesting to me is robot control. So a robot is you know, seven degree of freedom robot arm, seven degrees of freedom is like your arm, and you have a pretty am amazing machine learning um, processor between your ears that enables you to control that arm. Uh, we can do it with, with software that's not based on artificial intelligence and machine learning, but, it, but we are starting to find that there are some really good applications. But <laughs> the, autonom the autonomy doesn't, won't, won't ever do the work for you. You have to understand the basic principles and then you have to tailor that autonomous system to do exactly what you want. And I, and, and, and I can't stress that enough. So um, learn your basic principles, tinker. Don't forget that engineering is hard, not just because of the math and science, but because of the communication skills and the interpersonal skills and the cultural um, struggles that you go through. I'll tell you, I'm a really good math and scientist. That's the easy part, okay? And we need all of those skills. So, so culture them all. Uh, and build your network, and people matter more than anything else. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Bob. That's good. That's good. Thank you both for that uh, fascinating talk, uh, engaging discussion. Thank you, students, for the great questions, and we'll keep that going. So if I ask the students, who wants to go to outer space? Anybody? Okay, who wants to be in a space suit and float in outer space? All right, a few good people. Good, thank you. I'd like, now I'd like to introduce our next uh, Gilbreth lecturer, Dr. Caitlin Howell. Caitlin is Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Head of the Biointerface Biomimetics Lab at the University of Maine. Since 2016, she and her team have worked on drawing inspiration from nature and working across disciplines of biology, chemistry, material science to address major issues in human health. Inspired by how the human body controls its large, diverse bacterial cohorts, her work has led to discoveries and methods to resist infection in medical devices without need for antibiotics. With an eye towards securing the health of our planet citizens, Caitlin will discuss materials-based approaches to prevent biofilm-associated infections. Please welcome Caitlin Howell. It is so great to be here. I'm exceptionally honored to be able to talk with you today and also a huge shout out to all the students here because students, we're really gonna need your help with this one. Okay, all right. Who knows what this is? Yes, oh, I love it, I love it. Okay, so if you know this is bacteria, you probably also know that bacteria are around us all the time. They are on our surfaces, they are in the air, they are on our bodies, they are in our bodies. Most of the time, we don't notice them, right? They don't bother us, they don't really do much, eh, we're way too small to see. Sometimes they do really good things, right? Like when they make us cheese for pizza. Mm. And the ones inside of us that help us digest that wonderful pe cheese pizza. But when they decide to not do nice things, it can get really ugly, really fast. Bacteria make us sick. 
They can cause infections. And this is a really big problem. However, luckily, we have basically what amounts to a magic medicine, antibiotics. Raise your hand if you've ever used antibiotics. Everybody in this room, <laughs> at some point, we've had an ear infection, we've had strep throat, we've had something. And if you've taken antibiotics, you know that they really are magic. You take them and you start feeling better. And it's awesome, right? Well, I got some bad news. Slowly, little by little, they're not working so well anymore, right? Antibiotic resistance is a real problem. And folks, it's coming. But before we get too much into that, let's go back to a little bit of basic biology and talk about why this is happening. All right, consider, if you will, a population of green bacteria. Now, these green bacteria, like all living organisms, are made up of genetic material, which is a little bit different from cell to cell, right? We got some mutations in there. This is a thing. Uh, but we don't like these bacteria. We want them to go away. And so we're going to hit them with green bacteria antibiotics. Awesome, right? So this works really, really well, and most of the cells die. However, we had a few cells in there in that genetic mix because of the diversity. We're just a little bit purple. And it turns out that green bacteria antibiotics don't really work so well on purple, on purple bacterial cells. But most of the cells are gone, so we don't really notice. We think the problem is solved, and we go about our daily lives, and that's great, until some time passes, and suddenly the bacteria are back. But this time, we got a lot more purple cells. Maybe we don't know this, though, because we can't really see these things very well. So we're just going to hit it again with some green bacteria antibiotics. And the problem gets worse and worse and worse. Right? Yes? Sound familiar? So you may think, well, yeah, sure, but when is this actually happening? The answer is it is happening all across the world every single day. That patient that gets antibiotics prescribed to them for an infection, starts taking them, feels better and then decides, I better, I don't want to take medicine if I don't need it, right? That's the healthy thing to do. I'm going to stop taking my antibiotics, antibiotic resistance. It's that farmer, right, who knows that if he or she feeds their chickens with antibiotics, those chickens will get fatter. Because it turns out, if you kill the bacteria inside your chickens, the food that you then feed those chickens goes into making more chicken and less bacteria inside of chicken. Yes, it really is a thing, and that is happening more and more and more. They just came out with a report talking about how it's in, this problem is increasing. It's also those factories that are making these materials. And if they happen to be in a place where the environmental restrictions aren't so tight, maybe they're just dumping that waste into the environment, where it goes out and it affects the bacteria in the environment. Antibiotic resistance. Every single little one of these examples is a tiny drop in the bucket. But folks, we've been dropping into that bucket for the past 60 years, and now it's starting to get full. And the result is really, really devastating. Right now, we are living in the post-antibiotic world. Around the world, each year, 5 million people are dying of antibiotic-resistant antibiotic infections. And of those people, heartbreakingly, uh, about you know, most of them are children under five years old. It's really, really terrible. And this is just the beginning. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. So are we doomed? No, no not as long as there is an engineer standing, right? <laughs> we solve problems, and that's what we're going to do. Now, it's not going to be just engineers that solve this problem, though. It's going to be a huge team effort. We're going to need scientists. We're going to need medical professionals. We are going to need communities. It's going to be all of us in this together figuring out this solution. And the solution is not going to be just one-sided, right? It's going to be a lot of different avenues of attacking this. But at my group, the University of Maine, as you heard, we study bio-inspired solutions. And in particular, we focus on materials, because it turns out that bacteria really grow really, really well when they're sticking to surfaces. And so we're focusing on that. Now, bio-inspired engineering, for those of you that don't know, is really great. It's looking at nature for the way that nature solves problems, and then stealing those ideas and using them for human problems, right? OK, so please, if you would, Consider this beautiful idyllic scene. There are bacteria everywhere in this scene. <laughs> they are in the cows, they are in the soil, they are on the plants, they are in the air, they are everywhere. 
But this is not a rampant bacterial apocalypse. You don't have infections happening everywhere in this scene. Neither do you have massive use of antibiotics. So what's happening here? Hmm. The answer is there are a lot of things happening in this picture that is helping to control those bacterial populations. Um, but I could spend a year telling you about all the amazing things that's happening. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of ways that we still don't know how nature is doing this. So there's a lot here to discover. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to walk you through three these ones. I'm going to talk to you quickly about um, dragonfly wings and cicada wings, also uh, lotus leaves, and also that last one, which I think you had a hint about earlier, but well, I'm not going to tell you about it until we get a little bit later. All right, cicada and dragonfly wings. So we didn't know this until 2012, but actually it turns out that dragonfly and cicada wings are covered with nanospikes. Did you all know that? No, now you do. And a really, really interesting thing happens when bacteria interact with these nanospikes. They pop. If you take a bacterial cell and you push it down on top of these nanospikes, that bacteria cell will rupture. And what you get is basically a bunch of deflated balloons. This is really cool, huh? An amazing way that nature handles this. However, if we're thinking about not only identifying these solutions, but applying them to human problems, we got to think about whether or not this is actually going to apply to our problems with bacteria. So let me ask you a question. Once a bacteria goes pop on this surface, and then another bacterium comes along and sits on top of it, is the same thing going to happen? No. So this solution works great for dragonflies, because there's not that many bacteria coming down to land on their wings. And also, they're not really using that, their wings for that long. They don't live that long. So great solution for dragonflies and cicadas and maybe some short-term human use, but not really for the things that we really need. Okay. We need something that maybe is a little bit more replenishable, something that can be rejuvenated. So let's look at the lotus leaf. Did you know? that the lotus leaf has a really, really interesting way of keeping its surface clean. Turns out that if you look really closely on the surface of this lotus leaf, it has a series of bumps. And those bumps have a series of even smaller bumps on them, nano bumps, if you will. And all of these lovely bumps are covered with a material that resists water. It's hydrophobic. Okay. So what happens if a water droplet comes down and sits on this surface? Instead of sort of sticking and flattening out a little bit like it would on a flat surface, this, this water drop will actually sit on top of those bumps. And in sitting on top of those bumps, it is also sitting on top of those pockets of air in between the bumps. You know, water and air don't mix very well. The water doesn't like to be sitting next to the air. So when any sort of nice breeze or bump comes along, that water droplet can actually start to roll. And it can pick up any dust, dirt, bacteria along with it and roll right off. So this is great, right? Hey, here's a cool solution, replenishable. Oh, there's a trick. This only really works if you're interested in resisting water under ambient temperature and pressure. So under usual lotus leaf conditions, right? <clears throat> Probably not what we're interested in. When we're interested in resisting bacteria on materials, the stuff the bacteria is in is full of proteins, it's full of lipids, it's full of all kinds of gunk that is not going to do what this beautiful water droplet does. So maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Maybe we need to look a little bit closer to home. Hmm. I see lots of inspiration in this room right now. Did you all know that you have more bacterial cells inside of you right now than you have you cells? You are not just a human, you are a super organism of bacteria and human. And it's pretty cool because we're learning every day just how much our bacteria affect everything we do up to and including how we think. But. Think, if you will, about the place in your body that has the most bacteria. Anybody know what this picture is? I think I'm hearing it. <laughs> I'm hearing lots of great answers, and you're all really close. Intestines, yeah? OK, we're close. Intestines. <laughs> You have so many bacteria in your test intestines. And this is a beautiful picture. I did not take this picture. This was taken by Lars Varike of Ghent University. But I'm such a fan of it because it shows so beautifully really how the body is doing this. So here, up here, this Las Vegas party, 
Those are all the bacteria. Down here, you have your beautiful, fragile, susceptible intestinal cells. And the thing that is stopping these bacteria from getting to these cells and having a field day is your mucus. Now, if you walk away with nothing from this talk, I want you to walk away with the fact that your mucus is incredible. We think it's gross when we first start out, but now that you've been here, you can know that it is an absolutely amazing material. It is liquidy, it moves, it slides, it sloughs off, it replenishes. And now that we've actually started studying a little bit more, we're starting to see that it actually chemically communicates with the bacteria that it's interacting with. It can literally take a bacterium that wants to turn into something that could infect you, and it can send it chemical signals that says, nah, hey, chill, man, you're cool, you're good. Go into that nice dormant state, you're happy, you're fine. It's really, truly amazing. So as someone who does bio-inspired engineering, material science, I look at that and I go, okay, we wanna copy that. That is what we need. How do we do it? There is no way we're going to be able to mimic the beauty of mucus in its entirety. But what we can do is get close. So let's think about, at the very basic fundamental level, what is that doing? It's stopping the bacteria from getting to the cells. Let's see if we can copy that. Turns out we can, fairly easily. So in my lab, we're actually doing that on a material that is very widely used in medicine, silicone rubber, clear, squishy stuff. It's everywhere, in tubings, on machines. It gets implanted in people, and it's a great place for bacteria to grow. So it turns out, though, that we can make a mucus-mimicking layer on this simply by immersing this material in a bath of a compatible liquid. And when it does, this silicone rubber acts like a sponge. It sucks up all of that liquid, and when it's done, we end up with an infused polymer, an infused silicone rubber. It is that material infused with our liquid with another layer of liquid on top. You seeing the parallels with the intestines and the mucus here? All right, so let's try this. So we took this stuff into the lab and we tried it against one of the nastiest bacteria there are. This is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, causes huge problems in hospitals. Uh, so we actually took a bath of this stuff and we treated a piece of tubing we stuck this tubing in and we allowed the, the bacterial solution to pump around that tube over and over and over for 24 hours. Then we took it out, we stained the bacteria purple, and we saw what we had. Now in the picture I'm gonna show you next, we actually treated half of the tube and we left the other half of the tube untreated. Can you tell which is which? Yes, you can. Here, where we had no liquid layer, we had lots of bacteria growing. These things make beautiful, beautiful, thick, slimy biofilms, they're called, bunches of bacteria. On the part that was untreated when we looked at it, well, we saw a couple of glowy green things there, but really, really not much. So this was very exciting. We thought maybe we have something here. But in biomedical science, anyone can do anything on a lab bench. But all bets are off when it comes to a living system. You are so beautifully complicated that we could never in a million years mimic all of the stuff that happens inside of you all the time. So the only way to know if something really works is to try it in a living system. So at the University of Maine, I don't have the capacity to do that. But what I do have the capacity to do, and you all will as well, is make science friends. And I made a wonderful science friend at the University of Notre Dame her name is Professor Anna Flores Morales, and she's one of the leaders in studying what are called catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Raise your hand if you know what a catheter is. Okay, for those of you that don't, it's one of the most common medical devices. It is a little tube that is inserted up through the urethra into the bladder, and it allows urine to drain out for folks who cannot control that function, either because they've lost the ability or because they're under anesthesia. Very, very common. A huge source of infections. And my science friend, Dr. Flores Morales, studies this. And she had actually found that what causes the bacteria to stick so well to these devices was not actually the bacteria themselves, which is one of the most common assumptions right now. She told me, Caitlin, you know what it is? It's the proteins. You have proteins floating around inside of you all the time. And when you put a foreign object inside of you, the first thing that happens is proteins stick to it. And then the bacteria stick to the proteins. And that's what is causing the massive problem. So once these bacteria start to stick to these medical devices inside the bladder, the bacteria start to grow, and then they do something called dissemination. They spread to other organs. 
and that's when it gets really, really, really bad. Now imagine this situation with no antibiotics to solve it. Yeah. So she asked me, can this system also resist proteins? What do you think? Yes. yes. There's no reason why it shouldn't, right? It's a slippery, mucus-mimicking surface. Proteins are not also sticking to that mucus layer. So we designed an experiment. We were actually going to try our treated catheters, our liquid-infused catheters against this, and our hypothesis was that we would resist bacterial adhesion, and in doing so, we would resist dissemination. So here's a quick view of the results. This looks complicated, but let me walk you through it step by step. First, look over on the right there, just those pictures. There you can see fluorescent images. So we have protein sticking on the top. You can see our unmodified catheters, and then you can see our liquid-infused catheters. Can you see the difference? Where it's glowing, there's protein. The CTL there is our control. You've all read about controls and experiments, right? Yes, very important to make sure the system is working. E. coli, you've all heard of that? Massive problem in urinary tract infections. Again, where it's glowing, we've got bacteria. Where it's not, we don't. And then we actually put these two images on top so you can see if there's one where there's the other, and in fact, there is. So already, we were seeing that this is what's having an effect, again, in a living system. And this plot on the left here is where you see that quantified. So here, we have the amount of bacteria, CFUs, colony forming units. How many bacteria are there? I want to call your attention to the fact that this is a log scale. This is an order of magnitude every way up. Here, we have the different organs, and you have unmodified and liquid infused. You see the drop there when we have that liquid infused? Now, that doesn't look like much, but again, order of magnitude, that's a 90% drop. Yeah, these little bars up here means it was very statistically significant. And you saw we got that across the board. Non-significance right there, just because the bacteria hadn't gotten that far. These were, for us, jaw-dropping results for a living system. It was extraordinarily exciting, but even more exciting, we tried this against all of the top six pathogens that cause these types of infections in hospitals, and they worked against all of them, including this one, Candida albicans. It's a fungus, folks. They're even worse because we have even fewer medicines that help against them. So this was really, really exciting, and I think it shows that if we start thinking about the power of nature, we can really start getting places. But I want to take you one step further. Okay, consider this material. It's static, wood, oh, awesome, on top of it. <laughs> it's static, it sits there. It's wood, but it's not a tree, right? It's dead. It does what we need it to do in this situation, but it doesn't heal, it doesn't respond, it doesn't sense, it doesn't do anything like that. Maybe when we're thinking about materials, we're thinking a little bit too much like humans still. Hmm? Consider your materials. You can sense things. You can heal. You can respond to your environment. If we're talking about putting things into a living system, why would we want this and not this? Yeah, let's start thinking out a, a little outside the box, huh? All right, so let's take our, our favorite example here. And what is making this possible? Again, a lot of things. You're really complicated. But at the very basis, it's your vascular system. Your vascular system is carrying information and nutrients to your cells. It is taking away information and nutrients from your cells. It allows the whole system to keep going and going and going. So why can't we have vascular systems in our materials? Hmm? We can. Thanks to 3D printing, which we're gonna hear a lot more about, we can build vascular networks into materials, and so we did. We did this experiment where we built our vascular networks, and then we filled our vascular networks with our slippery mucus-mimicking material. And the concept was that when that layer was removed, more would come up from the vascular system and replenish. And we did this experiment where we actually removed our liquid layer over time. And you can see this is the amount of bacteria, our dry surface. It starts out low, and then it goes up and up and up. By the time we've removed most of that liquid, we're back to the same old surface. Now, when we put a vascular network in this, same samples, side by side. Suddenly, these can resist the bacteria, the bacterial attachment for the entire process of the experiment. But we can go even further. As I said, our vascular networks communicate with our tissues and can respond. So we said, let's do the same thing. We want to use our vascular network to listen to the bacteria. Let's hear what they're telling us, right? We need to know what's there in order to address it effectively. And then let's use it to respond. 
Let's control those bacteria and let's do this in a, in a loop constantly so we can act like a natural system. So we set up an experiment where we just listened to the bacteria. Here is our vascular network and our hypothesis was that when the bacteria grew on the surface, the compounds that they constantly produce would diffuse down into our vascular channels. We could collect them and see what was going on. This is how bacteria grow over time. You can see we get more and more and then they start to get static. We could do that by measuring on top and when we looked in our vascular system, we saw the same thing. We used two different methods of being able to test this. This was a very cheap absorbance measurement, matched that curve. And here, this is a more expensive measurement, but we found something we weren't expecting. Not only did we see the bacteria growing, we could also see them eating their food. So here we go, we could listen to the bacteria. Now, can we control them? Well, to do this, we can do a neat trick of bio-inspired engineering, which is we're not we're not defined by the same constraints as nature. We can actually define things and change things to better suit our needs. So what we did was actually change the way our vascular network looked like. And I asked my students, hey, can we make the bacteria grow in dots? And it turns out we could. By controlling where those channels were and, and putting into that vascular network a material that told the bacteria to stop growing, where that material rose to the surface, we got bacteria dying and where that material didn't reach, we got bacterial living. And so here was our theoretical experiment, and here was, our, here was our theoretical calculation, and here was our experiment. So the take home message, besides the fact that mucus is amazing, is that we can learn a lot by looking at nature. The antibiotic resistance crisis, we can solve it. There are a lot of ways that we can approach this, but this one, looking at how natural systems that have evolved over millions of years are solving this problem already, we can learn a lot from them and we can go forward into a future where we don't have to worry about this quite so much. All right, with that, my students, of course, and my funders, and thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Whatever. What? <laughs> oh, you already, it was already answered. Okay. Oh, awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Be, be sent. All right, Vicente Valenzuela, junior from Cabrillo High School. So going back to the beginning of the presentation with insects, how did you guys know that dragonflies were going to be the insect that works when there's butterflies, beetles, and a regular fly all with wings? That is an excellent question. So that was not my work. That was coming out of Canada and a collaboration with Australia. But the answer is we didn't know. <laughs> This is the cool thing about bio-inspired engineering. There's still so much to explore in nature. And I think someone was just looking at how these things were structured and probably happened to see a bacterial cell on there and went, wait a minute, what the heck is happening here? And then started to investigate further. This actually happens a lot. And so we get a lot of the really best inspiration as engineers from those crazy biologists that go out and they're just like, huh, I wonder what this looks like. I wonder how that works. And then they're collecting this information. It's, it's really a synergistic process. But that's a fabulous question. Um, I'm a I'm Xavier from Cabrillo. Yeah, but I was gonna say, how did y'all? Um, oh, how did y'all stop making the bacteria reproduce? How did we make the bacteria reproduce? How did y'all stop making it reproduce? How did we stop making the bacteria reproduce? That's, that's a great question. So we weren't, we weren't actually stopping them from reproducing because in a living system, we wouldn't be able to do that. So the thing that we were doing was actually just stopping them from adhering. 
And it turns out that when bacteria adhere to a surface, that to them is like being in a really, really nice place. They start to build a little house around them, if you will. They start to excrete these materials, these polymers, and they cover themselves with it. Have you all seen in a sink where it gets slippery when you have bacteria start to grow and it's gross? That's because what's growing on the surface is not just bacteria. It's bacteria plus all that stuff they pile around them to make them feel nice and protected. And the bad thing is that that material, it's called a biofilm all together, that can actually stop antibiotics from penetrating down to get to the bacteria and kill them. And it's another reason why we study materials, because they don't do that unless they've got a material to stick to. So that was an excellent question. We didn't stop them, but when we stop them from sticking, we stop them from building those biofilms, we naturally stop them from growing as much as they would have anyway. Hi, my name is Viviana Valenzuela. I'm a sophomore at Cabrillo High School, and I was wondering do you think that you could put your work into everyday hospitals? Yes, actually, that's an excellent question. And we are currently in the process of moving this through FDA approval. The Food and Drug Administration, the entity responsible for making sure that everybody, everything that gets to you in terms of medicine is safe and effective. We are starting the process of working with them and working with several companies because this is really a game changer and a lot of people recognize this. So excellent question. Hi, my name is Mia Barca. I'm a junior at Samuel Lee Academy. Uh, this is kind of related to her question, but I was wondering if you think at some point in the future um, you'll be able to create a synthetic mucus that will make hospital infections obsolete? I love that question. <laughs> I really hope so. That's my goal as someone who does bio-inspired engineering, right? I aspire to be able to mimic the beauty that is mucus, but it's really step by step. And it takes, you know, as we've heard before, it takes a lot of different people with a lot of different disciplines working together to make this possible, but I really hope that I'll be able to be a part of that puzzle because it would be extremely exciting because there's a whole lot more we could do, right? If we could control bacteria and make them do what we wanted them to do, we could go crazy. Great question. Hi, um, I'm Andrew Percussion, um, senior at Cabrillo. Uh, with the introduction of this technology to hospitals, could this affect like sterile processing technicians and how their jobs will be? Oh, that's a really good question. So I don't think so, because this is something that it is a coating that is meant to be put in one particular place. I think at no point in the future are we looking at being able to replace like surgical instruments with this type of stuff. And so sterilization in that sense is still gonna be the same. We still need a way to sterilize gowns, to sterilize masks. All of these variety of materials that are used in hospitals will still stay the same. But it's really just those materials that are really causing a problem and in infection that we're looking for solutions for because of the drive towards antibiotic resistance. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Sam. From, I'm senior at Cabrillo. Uh, my question is, so with whether it's the mucus or the, the what was it, like you kind of copied the mucus or whether it's anything else, do you see it moving to like maybe everyday cleaning supplies or like, uh, like how she said, like the hospitals and stuff? Like what do you think? That is also, that is a really, really good question. And I think this comes to a really interesting concept in materials engineering is that you really have to consider where it's going to be used. So. If, you were to, if I were to be able to design the perfect synthetic mucus, I would probably never put it on something like this because it's slippery. You can remove it if you slide it around enough. It's, it wouldn't be perfect for all situations. In our bodies, mucus is really only used in the one place where there's just a lot of bacteria and a great need and where it's sloughing off a little bit is not gonna be a problem and nobody's touching it and rubbing it. So I think every time we think about designing a new material or a coating, we need to consider that. Where will it be used? How will it be used? And does what it looks like make sense in that context? Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. That's a great one. Hi, my name is uh, Michael Bradfield from Cabrillo High School. I'm a junior. I was wondering if you used um, a bacterial prevention in dental care maybe, like could we use it on our teeth or like to prevent plaque buildup 
um, like a sticky web or even the coding that you were using? Mm -hmm. That's also a great question. There's actually somebody who did a study on that. It wasn't me, but they tried to put it on rabbit teeth to see if it would stop the buildup of bacteria. And in fact, it does. But there's a trick. You actually have to be able to treat the surface of the teeth to make that coating stick. So in the materials that I use, the coating sticks naturally because it's very compatible with the material that we're using as the, the base, the substrate. But in teeth, you would need to make the surface rough, and then you would need to apply a sort of chemical coating over that to make it stay put. So while it's possible, it might not be particularly practical, at least not in its current form. But I think there's a lot of capability now that we know that this approach can work to think about, well, how can we change the design? to be able to make it work in a, in a place like that. And that's another thing we could all use your help with. So, got any ideas? One more question? We have, we have one. Um, hi, my name's Eric. Uh, I'm from Somali Academy and I'm a junior here. Uh, I would like to ask about, you know, the fish that have mucus on them. Have you ever tested that? Yes, there actually have been lots of studies looking at that type of mucus and what it does and how it helps and ideas about how we can use that to make, for example, ships go faster. Because what that really does is it reduces the friction against the water, which we, we may think that, you know, water, you just slide through it, it's no problem, but it actually does produce drag. It slows things down. So people have looked at that, yes, and that's another excellent example of let's think about nature and what does the thing that we'd like to sort of kind of do and let's see if we can take that idea. So already you're on the path. Great question. One final question, maybe? Anybody? <laughs> maybe over here. Uh, I had a question. Is there any way that we could use, could we use mushrooms in biomedical? In mushrooms in biomedicine? Yes. Yeah. So you mean like the materials of mushrooms or you mean using mushrooms as medicine? We don't want to specify. Yes, <laughs> the answer is absolutely yes. And I think we're actually going to be looking a lot more at mushrooms lately in the context of this. So do you remember at one of those I pointed when, we, when I was talking about the bacteria that, it, that uh, the system worked against and I said, this one's a fungus, that's really bad. Do you all know why it's, <laughs> fungi are so much more difficult to control than bacteria? Spores, yes, but fungi are actually really pretty closely related to you compared to bacteria. So anything that will kill a, a fungal cell will also kill a U cell. That's part of the reason why it's so difficult to get rid of, of mushrooms, right, of fungi. So, however, in the kingdom of fungi, there are a lot of control strategies that they use. So I think we're gonna go in the direction of looking at those to see if we can find solutions to our current fungal problem. Thank you for your question. Okay. <laughs> All right, are we good? Thank you very much. I have, uh, Caitlin, I have two things to say to you. One is, if you can bottle that enthusiasm, you'll get rich, okay? We, we can all use it. And, and secondly, I'm not going to look at my, my amazing mucus in the same way as I go forward. So thank you. We now have a 30-minute break. We'll be back here at, at 310. Okay, there's, there's food and stuff outside. Okay, we have two more speakers to finish out the day. Our next Gilbert lecturer is Dr. Brian Post. Brian is a senior research staff member and group leader at the Manufacturing Systems Design Group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He has been a technical leader on all of Oak Ridge large-scale additive manufacturing research. This includes the Big Area Additive Manufacturing System, BAM, I think, which was used to make the world's first 3D printed car, the Strati, and, and the Oak Ridge 3D printed Shelby Cobra. Cobra. Oak Ridge also ha, ha, has also used the system to create submarines. This is 3D printing we're talking about now. Submarines, wind turbine blade molds, a, a mobile home, and the production tooling for precast concrete installations. Brian's team is now developing a rapidly deployable cable-driven 3D printer for printing concrete 
objects at construction scale. Brian will address current and future capabilities for large-scale 3D printing of industrial materials. Please help me welcome Brian Post to the podium. Okay. Well, I have a really hard act to follow, um, but, uh, but I think that this is a, a really excellent opportunity. I'm, I'm super excited. Um, it's not every day that you get to address some of the most respected engineers uh, in the world and the next generation of young, talented uh, engineers to come. Um, so um, I think I have one of the coolest jobs on the planet, um, and, and, maybe, and I, that's uh, a, a lot to say in a room full of National Academy members and, and also my colleagues. Uh, maybe Bo doesn't count because his stuff is not on the planet. So, uh, so that, that's a little different. Um, but what I want to start, uh, and I think what, what's really exciting about the work that I get to do is I get to work with some really talented interdisciplinary engineers on solving today's manufacturing challenges, right? And so uh, manufacturing is a really interesting area, especially um, given our place in the world. Um, so I want to start by asking you a question. All right, so, um, so maybe we'll start with the National Academy members. How many of you, uh, when you were in primary school, had a class that looked like this, right? Where you had somebody that was uh, instructing you on how to mold raw material feedstocks into end-use components, right? All right, Al almost all of... Wood shop was a favorite, right? Metal fabrication, those things were, were, were taught in school. Uh, and how many of the, the students have had classes like this or are gonna have classes like this? Right, so, so as a proportion, and, and that's actually really inspiring because the, and for, from my perspect, uh, perspective and experience, um, because I was interested in going to college, uh, that opportunity was not afforded to me. Right, uh, I had to t go to a, take a bus to another vocational school if I was on the technology uh, path. Um, and so if you look at the way that we've, as a society, thought about manufacturing, right? We've said, okay, it's a dirty, dangerous, and, and, uh, and, and difficult profession. Um, you know, making things isn't something that, that the U.S. is that interested in anymore, right? And, uh, and we've started to see that uh, show up in things like the trade deficit. Right, and uh, and I think we've we've all seen nowadays, right, in the last three years, how many of you have tried to buy something that you couldn't get, or that it took a long time for you to get? That's almost everybody, right? Toilet paper, right? Everybody remembers toilet paper, um, but we've been we've become really reliant on these long, fragile uh, international supply chains, right? These these uh, these opportunities for us to to make things domestically have kind of uh, disappeared. Um, and you see that impact across all of the different sectors. If you look at like manufacturers and you say, how many of you experienced a, a, a delay uh, that caused a significant impact in your business? Like this is just last year, it was like 70% uh, for a given week. Um, so it's, a, it's becoming a, a bigger and bigger problem. And I think that's an opportunity, right? So, so what I want to challenge you guys today is that uh, manufacturing is an opportunity for you. Right, it, it is where we need to, to go. So if you take some of the most critical things that, that we're working on and, and that we need for the success of our nation, right, we aren't able to source all of those pieces domestically. So take, for example, wind turbines. Almost all of the wind turbines that we get, all of the pieces are manufactured internationally and then we assemble them here. Right, that's the blades, that's the nacelles, that's the generators and gearboxes, that's the tower structures. Right? And so we have to ship those internationally. That's a huge carbon uh, problem. So when you're taking these systems that are, that are, that are going to be uh, renewable energy and, and cleaner energy, and then we have to ship them, you know, these giant heavy castings from China, uh, that, uh, that takes some of the, the, the benefit out, away from them. And if you look at across our, you know, national security complex too, that becomes a problem. So these are huge challenges that we have. Now, why am I optimistic? Okay, so out of the students, how many of you have access to this? One, something like this. It's almost everybody, right? This has become the new entry point for, um, for, for, for students to learn about manufacturing technologies, right? So if you look at traditional castings and forgings and machining and those kind of operations, most of those opportunities in the United States to learn about those things and become introduced to them through your primary education have, have gotten diminished, but 
3D printing has become a new technology and been democratized in such a way that, that most of you have access to it, right? Um, and so this is really exciting, right? This is an opportunity space that we can get into. So my challenge to you is that, you know, this is, the, this is where the starting point, right? I want to show you that you can actually use this to make real stuff that has uh, impact um, and that we can use. And I think it's another tool in the toolbox of manufacturing, but it is the gateway from which you guys can launch your careers in manufacturing. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about some different types of uh, 3D printing technologies, and, and I want to start with some assumptions, right? And, uh, and this is uh, a new modern day manufacturing of, of 3D printing uh, structures. Um, we, we always say that 3D printing is exquisite. We can make really interesting things. Take, for example, this is a titanium robot hand that we built, right? And so it's got this lattice structure, and it's got an embedded hydraulic system, um, and so the pump goes in here, and you can actually flex these fingers by turning the, the hydraulic system on and off and, and, and using this pump, right? It's precise. You can make things that are very accurate. This is actually um, a bracket that we, uh, is now in a nuclear reactor, right? So we're able to create materials um, and processes and qualify and certify them that can go inside of some of the most demanding applications on Earth, right? It's, uh, it's optimized. Right, so this is a good example. This is a carbon sequestration system for coal-fired power plants. So you have a fluid that's coming in and then dripping down, uh, and this complex surface makes the path really tortuous. So you have um, it, the, lots of mixing opportunities for the, the gases that come in and mix with that fluid, and you're also simultaneously using it as a heat exchanger to extract heat from that, that gas so that the, those fluids can work more effectively. So really complicated structure, right? So you can optimize, and it's multifunctional, right? So we can actually do things like, um, this is a single block of metal, right? Which we've introduced the energy in such a way to change the grain structure and orientation of those um, structures within the, 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 the block so that even though it's a monolithic material, um, if you look at the microstructural map of that, you get the Mona Lisa, right? So this is just changing the energy input and the materials um, throughout the structure. It's the same material. Right, so we have the ability to really control material properties in a way that you couldn't before. Right? But if we think about the way that industry treats uh, 3D printing now, we would say that it's expensive and it's slow. Right? And so those are the major drawbacks. Um, and I say that if we, if we accept those assumptions as they are today, we're missing out on the, the, the potential future of these kind of processes. Um, so when you, if you ask me what I want to be when I grow up, I actually want to be Elsa. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that what we want to achieve is the ability to really build with no size limits, right? She's fabricating this thing out of thin air, right? Out of, I mean, achieve instantaneously uh, high build rates with unbelievable material properties, uh, unlimited geometric constraints. This is a really hard thing to build traditionally, right? Um, and, uh, and we want to do it for little to no cost. Right now she's fabricating it out of thin air, right? But I think we can use some materials that are more realistic. Um, but, uh, but this is really where we need to go. So how do we get closer to her vision and her dream, right? So we can look at existing processes, right, that we have that are these conventional manufacturing processes and see how they're ap applicable to 3D printing technologies. So, for example, this is a polymer extruder. You'd see one of these inside of an injection molding machine or, or in making tubing or, or things like that. Uh, this, these are the feedstocks for that process, right? They're polymer pellets. Most of the 3D printers you're probably familiar with use wires, right? So imagine that wire chopped up into little pieces. That's what the feedstocks are for these um, polymer machines. Um, these are inexpensive, $1 to $10 a pound pretty typically. Or we can use, you know, MIG welding processes or other types of welding processes and materials like wire, which are less expensive than the powder feedstocks that we use for 3D printing today. Uh, in most of the cases. Or we can even use things like concrete. If you look at the materials we have available for 3D printing, right, most of them are in the $1 to $200 a pound range. Concrete's three cents a pound, right? So there's opportunities in, in, in going to lower and lower cost systems. Um, and then we partner with industry to understand what the key needs are, what the key drivers are for the technology, and what the, the fundamental limits are. Uh, and then build systems that make sense for the different processes. So these are all systems that, I'll show you some of them, 
uh, all systems that we've built uh, in partnership with industry and then commercialized uh, so that they can go out and make real world, real world impacts. Um, so the first one I want to talk to you about is, is on the large scale polymer side, right? So this is a process we call BAM, Big Area Additive Manufacturing. What we did is we took uh, conventional extrusion technologies for polymers and a robotic CNC machine. This was actually a laser cutting uh, system and we put those two things together. Uh, wrote all the software we needed for it, figured out how to, to generate the tool path to, to execute this, uh, this large object. Uh, and then we pushed ourselves to, to, for this moonshot to print a car, right? And do I think everybody's gonna be driving 3D printed cars? No, right? But it was an application that allowed us to push the boundaries of what was possible, right? And from that, we, we learned a lot of stuff, right? Let me give you an example. Um, what we're printing is black, right? And the car is black. Why do you think the material is black? Anybody have an idea? Cheap? It's not because it's cheap. Anybody? Carbon. I heard carbon. All right, so we put carbon fiber in it, right? And why would we want to do that? It turns out that um, when you print something, or when materials are really hot and they get molten, they expand, right? And when they cool down, they want to contract. Right, and they want to shrink. So if you have a, a, a cold layer that's already contracted, you put a hot layer on top of it, and as it cools down, it wants to pull on the previous layer. So if you ever 3D printed something, you start to see like little pieces fall, come up on the corners. That's what's happening. Um, carbon fiber has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. So it doesn't expand very much when you heat it up, and it doesn't contract very much when you cool it down. So we take out a lot of that polymer, we replace it with, uh, with carbon fiber, then it shrinks less and allows us to build larger objects without as much distortion, right? So uh, a lot of the material you'll see we're printing is black, right? We've actually been working with the University of Maine recently on biomaterial printing. So we're printing stuff with bamboo fibers and with, uh, with wood flour and other things that go in there to perform the same function as the carbon but are less expensive and give us the, and, and combined with a, with a uh, compostable, uh, 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 neat resin, uh, give us something that can be recycled or, or reused. Okay, uh, and then this was the first car, and then a short four months later, we printed this car, right? So the opportunity to, to improve and, and, and keep working on what you're doing um, is, is always there. Okay, another application space, and actually I was working with Karma on this back when she was at DOE. Um, this is in precast tooling. So I said not everybody's going to drive 3D printed cars, um, but it can touch your lives in a different way. Right? So this is the conventional process for making uh, precast concrete. So you have a cabinetry shop that's employed to build these big molds. Um, and then from that, you can get about 20 pours. So you can pour concrete into it about 20 times, and you can strip those molds. And then after that, the concrete forms start to fall apart, and you can no longer use them. Um, so they were interested in, they had this specific application, I'll show you here in a second, um, uh, whether or not we could 3D print some of these forms. Right? And so what we did is we actually um, used the large printer that we developed to print uh, and then took it over and, and machined it to get a nice surface finish. Uh, and then these are the, the, the test form works that we used um, and gate precasted the, the actual pouring of the concrete, made a lot of these structures. And it turns out what it's for is actually this building in Brooklyn. Right? And so each, uh, this is uh, on the old Domino Sugar Factory uh, location. And so this building is meant to look like a sugar cube. Um, and so what that means is that they wanted to reflect light differently from each side of the building. And so the number of molds that they were going to need to accomplish this was measured in the hundreds, right? Because if they can only get 20 windows off of each mold and, and they have, you know, a thousand windows, um, then they have to rebuild those molds a lot. Um, so we were able to print about 40 of these, uh, of these molds and they made all of the residential tower of this building using that. So if you're ever in New York City, uh, look across the river into Brooklyn, and that's, uh, that's a building that was made through 3D printing, right? It's pretty cool. Okay, so that's polymers, right? And we've done a ton of more things with polymer systems, but I want to move on to a different material system. Uh, this is metallic welding. So we're using conventional MIG welding technologies. Uh, they've been out there for a really long time, um, and a lot of interesting process control and, and, uh, and tool path generation. Um, so we've got three serial robots, each with six degrees of freedom. 
Uh, and then a rotating table. So that's a total of, uh, what, 19 degrees of freedom working together to try to solve an assembly problem, uh, like, like Bo was mentioning. Right? But each one of these is, uh, is extruding material, uh, welding directly on top of layer by layer. Um, and they're collaborating. So we have a list of all the layers that need to be made uh, and all of the tool paths within a single layer that needs to be made. And they're being dynamically assigned to each of the robots and they're taking a little sector of it and, and producing it individually. Um, you'll notice as we get to the top, one of the robots will be removed. That's actually to balance the thermal history of the part to keep it from getting too hot so that it would, it would collapse. And so we're able to start to build into these control systems the ability to, to modulate the process to achieve specific material property sets that we want. Um, first demo we really did with this technology was building the arm of an excavator, right? So this gives you an idea of the scale in which we can, we can build these things. Uh, this, this machine is capable of building stuff about six feet in diameter by about six feet tall. Um, and, uh, and there are now bigger versions of this kind of process that are, that are being developed. We're currently working on one right now using electroslag um, strip cladding, which is a much higher throughput version. Uh, this will get us up to about 180 pounds of material an hour per head. So we'll be able to build large scale casting replacements really fast. Um, and the conditions of this bath, we think give us the ability to do actually in situ reduction of iron ore. So we can create steel um, without a foundry process. So we can get near net shape, close to the final geometry of a low cost casting for things like wind turbine applications. So if you need a, a hub or a bed plate, bed plate casting. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in, in, in the large scale metal space as well. Okay, so we've talked about polymers, we've talked about metals. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, concrete. Okay, so if you look at traditional construction technologies, um, this is from 1890. Uh, and this is my house when it was being built in 2016, right? It looks very similar, doesn't it? Uh, I think we, in, in the construction industry, we've kind of skipped a couple of the industrial revolutions. Um, the, we should be able to, to, to bring uh, some of that automation uh, to bear. If you look at the cost of a car and the cost of a house, right? Um, houses are usually about 10 times more expensive than a car. And I'll argue that it's not because the house is more complex. Right? The car has, you know, internal combustion engine that's converting, can, you know, fuel energy into kinetic energy. Uh, you've got a climate control system. You've got multiple computers. You've got, it's a very complicated system, right? And your house is kind of sticks and, uh, and rocks glued together and, and screwed together. Um, but the reason why we can make cars more effective is the assembly line, right, and, and automation. And so we don't have that in, in construction. And so we started looking at opportunities to, to improve that. And there are people out there that are printing concrete or, and making, making housing structures with it. I don't know necessarily if that's the right application space, but it's an interesting technology that we need to start uh, looking at. Um, so we started from a little bit different uh, perspective. We're robotics people, and we were interested in what is the appropriate robot system to do concrete deposition. And so, what you really want is something that can adapt to the site, right? So if construction happens on site. You want to have some system that can go out there and, and be useful on the specific terrain. And so we started looking at different kinds of robots, and, and we really came up the, on, upon the SkyCam. So if you, how many of you have seen this before? I think everybody, this is like at a sporting event on a football field. It kind of flies over. Um, now, they don't have one of these per stadium. Right, is actually a, a company that goes around and does it at each of the stadiums and they just pack it up and move it to the next one. So it's adaptable to the specific stadium. Um, it's put up for a specific part of the game, part of the, the application, and they take it down and they move it to the next place. We really wanna be able to do that with a concrete deposition system. And so we, we kinda of said, okay, that's the sky cam. Can we come up with sky bam? Right, something that allows us to do this large scale thing. Um, and so, we found this thing, it was a hang printer. It was a, it was a guy in, in, in uh, Norway um, who said, okay, let's start there, right? And then we started looking at what the cable orientations might need to be, um, modeled uh, the, the stiffness of the system and the configurations, uh, figured out what the workspace might be, and then we figured out that if we change the cable orientations, we can actually get higher stiffness in plane, which is what we really care about. We wanna be very accurate as we move uh, and, and deposit the layer. 
Um, and, uh, and then we can also reduce the overhead to one single point. So you could have any kind of crane come out there and just hold it up in space. Uh, and then if we measure where everything is, we can compute the kinematics we need in order to drive this around very accurately. Um, and, and that's what we ended up building, right? Um, so we compute all of the, the, the cable lengths, what they need to be to reach any point in that space. Um, but that gets us kind of close, right? So cables are long, they're stretchy. We don't necessarily know where they're gonna be. Um, so what we do is we actually use uh, an auxiliary measurement system to shoot uh, with a laser uh, reflector here, and then we use the time of flight of that to figure out exactly where that is in three-dimensional space, and then we tie that into the control system that's paying out the cables, so we can change it a little bit to make it to make it more accurate. And when we do that, we go from errors that are over, you know, about an inch down to errors that are in like the thirty thousandths of an inch, so very accurate over a really large workspace. And, and it's scalable. If I need to make a bigger one of these, I just add a little bit more cable, right? And if I need to make a smaller one, I just subtract a little bit more cable. And so this is a pretty exciting uh, way to, to make these kind of um, big systems. I'll show you, so that you know it actually worked, uh, I'll show you a, ver a, a version of our demo system. And so you'll see in the background um, some of these cable winding systems. And then this is the deposition head. Uh, we're feeding concrete down uh, through this hose and it gets, comes out of this nozzle, and we orient the nozzle to, to shape the trajectory of the, of the bead. Um, here we're, we're doing a project we did with the Building Technology Office and FEMP, uh, who's the main sponsor, Federal Energy Management Program, to look at smart wall structures. So imagine your wall was actually a thermal battery. So you have some thermal mass there, you can charge it at night uh, by, by pumping cold water through it um, when energy costs are low, and the building is unoccupied, and then as the day starts to heat up and you get people in, in your building uh, and you start to, to turn on the HVAC system, um, what if we could shave the peaks on those demands by just re releasing energy from this wall structure? And so we, we demonstrated this. It happened to be right at the beginning of COVID when we were doing this, so the people in the building were a problem because everybody was working from home. <laughs> But, uh, but we found one conference room that was being used uh, a couple times a week, and so that's where we demoed this on. It actually worked pretty well. Um, so we figured out how to do all of this, and, and now we're commercializing that system um, through, through a company called Orbital Composites. Um, this is also uh, something that, that there's interest in for using on uh, non-terrestrial applications. So, so if you want to print something on the moon, Rather than carrying this giant gantry robot up there, like we, we, the one we have at the University of Maine, um, we send something like this up there. It's a lot less mass to carry. Um, it can be assembled and, and can do kind of the same job. Okay. Now, uh, as we scale systems, right, we get larger and larger, right? In the natural world, we don't do that, right? So what we end up doing is dividing up the problem so that we can do it. If you look at the construction, site, you don't just have one giant person that's doing everything, right? You have a bunch of people that are collectively doing things. If you do, look at honeybees, right? Um, you don't have one giant bee that's controlling where every little bit of material gets deposited. You break up the problem into to smaller chunks, right? And so we're looking at these kind of class of systems that um, make things that are larger than themselves, right? So, um, so what we're looking at is, okay, we've been developing these big gantry systems. Can we actually make those individual agents? And so this is uh, a robotic platform that can move in any direction at any time. So it can go left, it can go right, it can turn in space, and it can go diagonally um, however you want it to. Uh, and then we've got a, a six degree freedom robot arm with a really uh, heavy payload capacity. And then we've got one of those polymer extruders on it. Um, and what we're doing is basically we can print and then once the robot arm runs out of reach and it gets kind of bound, we can just like move the platform back and then we can keep printing, right? And if we can keep doing that, uh, then we can build things of basically unlimited size, as long as we know where we are in space, right? As long as I know where the, the robot is, is touching, then I can keep building stuff. And so we're using that same laser tracker that we, we figured out how to use in the previous project to, to do the recognition of where we are. And so that gives us an accuracy of, of about uh, three thousandths of an inch over really unlimited workspace as long as we keep registering the coordinate system. Okay, and then this is my last slide. So 
Um, if we take that to its logical conclusion, uh, we got really inspired by these, these drone lights displays. I don't know if you've seen those before. Um, but imagine if instead of a point of light, each one of those is acting kind of like a mud wasp, right? It had a little bit of material, and it could bring it to the location, and it could deposit it, right? And it could form it. Um, and so we started looking at uh, actually flying uh, drones and then depositing materials with, with, uh, with drones. And so it's kind of taking that, that, uh, that decom decomposition problem to the next stage. And I, I think this is, this is eventually how um, we're going to start building these kind of large structures, by decentralizing the, the fabrication process. It's much more complicated, but it's much more inspired by nature, and I think that's how we'll get uh, where we need to go. So with that, I, I am done with my presentation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. My name is Dan Dio from Cabrillo. And when you mentioned a uh, biological, um, when you 3D, 3D print with biological materials, yeah. could you uh, use, like research that material and apply it to like realistic limbs, give it more like an elastic effect? Also with like organs, you know, how you could replace those organs with 3D printed like yeah, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, of people that are really interested in that, that specific problem, right? How do we replace uh, structures of the body, for example, or, or, or give new functionality to, to people who might be missing it, right? And, uh, and so most of those have been in kind of like these lattice structures. So you create this kind of scaffold under which you can take cell growth and have it replicate over a structure. So you can create done like ears and stuff that are the, and, and there are actually people looking at 3D printing meat, which is a whole thing. Uh, you know, that is uh, an active area of research, especially in academia, right? Um, we tend to live on the industrial side uh, of that kind of equation, but it is a very interesting and open area of research that a lot of people are actually working on right now. Hi, um, my name is Jade Pensado from Samali Academy, and I'm a junior. Um, I was just wondering what type of motor does the SkyBam or like the cable winding mechanism use? And oh, so, is it so, reliable? So, the, so the, they use electric motors, right? So they use what's called a servo motor. So it's a, a motor that can move, and then it has a little encoder on it. It's a little glass wheel that has some, some dashes on it. So every time it rotates past this little optical sensor, you can count one tick mark. And so you know exactly where that is in space. And then that cable winder is actually kind of cool. It slides back and forth so that the place in which the cable comes off the drum is always the same. Uh, and so we know by how many rotations we've done exactly how much cable we've let off of that drum. And so that's how we track that very accurately um, as, we, as we pay in and out the cable. Um, it's close, but we have to use that external measurement system to get even closer. Hi, my name is Michael Bradfield. I'm a junior and I attend Cabrillo High School. Um, I was wondering what are other products besides carbon that could prevent distortion uh, in materials? Okay, so you can add almost anything that'll take away some of the plastic, right? And uh, carbon happens to do it really well because it's very stiff and, and has very low CTE, so a coefficient of thermal expansion, but you can use glass fiber. We're using uh, you know, cellulosic fibers, we're using bamboo, things like that. Um, you can also use minerals. Um, so there are lots of different options for, for things you can do. Putting different materials in the polymer is actually like just a, a wide open space that we're exploring. So, so one of the things that we were really interested in is like if you keep everything hot for a long period of time and it cools down uniformly, you get less of that distortion. Um, so we like put a little bit of metallic particles in there and then you can couple to it inductively um, and keep that whole thing hot. And, and as it gets higher and higher in temperature, um, the magnetic the response goes down. And so you can actually set what that temperature is that it, it held, holds everything at. Um, so there's, there's lots of tricks you can play by adding these little things into it. Um, and it's something that we, we kind of found through that moonshot. You go, 
Uh, I just need to get through this. I'm gonna figure out what will work right now. Carbon is the most expensive thing, but it works. We're gonna get to the end. And then you start to open up these areas of research and those become really long lasting and, and very impactful things that you can do um, that I don't know if we would have come across if we hadn't pushed really hard to try to get uh, a car, right? Um, I'm Andrew Purifkastion, uh, senior at Cabrillo High School. Could um, innovation in large-scale 3D printing improve speeds and um, pricing? Of, of, of what we manufacture? Uh -huh. uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, right now the material costs are probably a little bit more expensive, right? But if you start counting into things like transportation, right, if we're, if we're sourcing things internationally and we can source them domestically, um, and then there's, there's, there's real costs associated with like lead times, right? So if, I, if it takes me six months to get something and I'm bottlenecking the rest of my process, but I could make it today, but it costs 10 times more, there are times when those kind of trade-offs really matter, right? And so, uh, so I, I think there are lots of opportunities. We've seen lots of places where that kind of impact is, is real. Um, often that's in like tooling, for example. So if you need a uh, stamping die, to make uh, car components, right? Um, I can either send out for it and have it made internationally and it'll come in nine months later, or I can make it uh, right here. It might be more expensive, but I can make it quickly. I can add some additional functionality that I might not have had before, like conformal cooling right next to the surface of the tool. Um, so there, there are different ways in which you can measure the impact or value of, uh, of that kind of manufacturing. Hi, my name is uh, Santos Merito. I go to Cabrillo High School, I'm a junior, and uh, I was wondering if you could like eventually 3D print like rocket ships or robotic arms so that Mr. So that Mr. Bo could send them into space. <laughs> Absolutely, there's, there's a company called uh, Relativity Space right now that is taking that, that, uh, that wire welding, MIG welding process and turning that into rockets. Right, we, we've done some, uh, we, we've sent uh, about four things into space in the last year um, uh, at, at really high speeds into really high uh, altitudes uh, that have been printed, right? So uh, it, is, it is not only a possibility, it is an actuality. Hi, uh, Carl Benjamin Vergado, a senior from Cabrillo High School and uh, regarding uh, the never-ending possibilities of 3D, uh, large-scale 3D printing. Um, I was just wondering if um, it has the potential to truly replace uh, traditional and current um, industrial and manufacturing processes currently. So, so replacement of existing technologies, I don't think that's the right way to think of it, right? It's another tool in the toolbox, right? And, and it can be an expanding tool in the tool set, right? There's always going to be things that are better done through another process, right? But there might be specific applications where this is the right way to do it. And, and as engineers, it's kind of our job to evaluate the solution space, figure out what the right manufacturing technology is and employ it. It might be that additive is a way in which we can produce the tooling for that other, that other application space. It might be a, a way, another way that we can, we can support it through packaging or, or other things. But it might be a piece of that puzzle that we need in order to solve, uh, solve the, the challenges that we have. You know, for example, if, a, if there's a way to take you know, really large casting and make it smaller castings, right, that we could do in an additive for, uh, form or, or through support of uh, casting processes that you can then assemble through an additive process, and there's lots of different ways to think about it. But I don't think it'll ever be a true drop-in replacement for every manufacturing process that we have. Um, I think it'll keep expanding and expanding um, and being more useful and more useful. Uh, Jacob Cervantes, uh, Senior Assembly Academy. Would 3D printing houses help lead to more accessible and affordable housing options? I, I think um, there are opportunities for, um, for housing in 3D printing. Right, everybody right now is kind of 3D printing wall structures. And wall structures are kind of like the fastest and cheapest things that we make about a house. Right, so I don't know if that's the right application space for it or, we, or if we have the right material set that we need yet. Um, but I think there are opportunities for, you know, once you've figured out the automation piece, um, bringing in new materials and new processes um, to, to, to make real impacts there. 
There are some circumstances like disaster relief, right, when there's not a lot of uh, capability for, for highly skilled workers to come back to an area to, to build uh, housing. In that case, bringing in some more automation like, like uh, 3D printing might make a lot of sense, right? But it's about balancing those different competing objectives to figure out where it really can be applied. So that last question. Um, hello, my name is Joseph Bartash. Uh, I'm a sophomore from Samueli, and I was wondering, what do you think the future of 3D printing looks like? Oh, that's a hard question. That's a really hard question. I don't think anybody really knows. Right, um, I, you know, there's plays, and it really depends on the application sector, right? Um, Casting and foraging, I think we've got an idea of where that's going, right? We're gonna do these kind of large-scale metal processes. Uh, the polymer systems, we've got kind of an idea. When we start to get to like space systems, I don't know, right? There, there's lots of things that work on Earth that might not work in space, and there's lots of, and so it really depends on, on what type of application you're trying to target, right? I, I, for me, I'm really interested in things like scaling laws. Right, how big could we go? Right, I don't think we've answered that. Um, we keep we keep coming up with new ways to like, oh, if I just use this process rather than this one that's existing, I can go a little bit bigger, right? But I don't think we really know where those things end yet, and so I think we're going to have to figure out what the boundary conditions are on, on that on that specific question, right? Um, and then that's that's the job of us as engineers is to figure out how to make the most uh, impact that we can, right? So take a couple of those targeted applications and really work towards them, try to find out what all the problems are and then address them one by one. So I don't have an answer, but, uh, but I hope that helps. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. You really do have an interesting job on Earth. And, uh, I have two questions for you, though. How, how much does that Cobra car cost, and what kind of deal can the president of the National Academy of Engineering get? It's been up at the DOE headquarters now. It's time to take it up to the secretary of Okay, we can talk offline then. Okay, good, all right. Our final Gilbreth lecture for today, and our closer is Dr. Karma Sawyer. Karma is the division director over, uh, overseeing electrically, electricity infrastructure and buildings at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, PNNL. She is responsible for shaping and managing a vision and strategy to ensure that the laboratory addresses the Department of Energy's most important challenges in energy efficiency, clean energy, and electricity infrastructure. She has worked collaboratively with the national laboratories and external stakeholders to advance cross-cutting initiatives such as grid interactive efficient buildings, advanced building construction, and grid modernization. Please welcome Karma, who will discuss equitable building decarbonization through electrification. Karma. I have to say, it is an honor to be here today. Um, I'm new, usually not a person who gets nervous, but being a closer for this group of speakers is, is quite a tough position to be in. Um, I'm excited, though, to talk to you about this problem today. It's a problem like all of my colleagues that really needs the next generation of engineers. Um, and I was inspired by one of the last things that Bo said in his presentation, which is that you know, in engineering, it's, it's really about people, and, and that is absolutely true for the problem of decarbonization. Um, and so I'm eager to hear some ideas from you all how we could potentially address it. So, um, climate change. It poses a significant risk to virtually all human and natural systems, either directly or indirectly. And reducing greenhouse gases that are driving climate change are gonna require sharp reductions in coal, natural gas, and oils, and large increases in renewable energy. And that form, transformation alone is a formidable engineering and societal challenge. But it is already happening. 
but virtually all of those energy systems are sensitive to the environmental changes from cl the climate and on a lot of different timescales. These decarbonized energy systems like solar and wind and hydro, they are that much more sensitive. They are intermittent and as a result, the energy supply could become less stable. And, and we are managing that. There are talented engineers out there right now whose job it is to figure this stuff out. Several of them work for me. But as our energy system transitions and as the climate changes, oftentimes people will feel those changes in their homes and in their buildings. That's gonna be the front line. And there is increasing awareness that these impacts, both in the energy system transition and in climate change, they are not experienced equally by all people in society. The reality is that people have very different needs from their energy system. So elderly and disabled people, they use energy in different ways. They have different vulnerability profiles. So, I mean, I see that in my own household. Uh, I have an 11-year-old son with a severe disability. He uses an iPad for his communication. So if he is not able to charge that device, he cannot communicate his basic needs to people outside of his immediate family. That is not typical, but his right to communicate is a real thing that the energy system has to be able to deliver. Low-income households, we see in the news all the time, they spend a higher percentage of their bills on energy than affluent households. That can be a factor of three and five. We're looking at people, we heard about the crisis in Ukraine and the impact not having natural gas is having on people's livelihoods. So I just finished telling you about how this clean energy transition is already happening. But in reality, that is true, but it's not quite that simple. Black majority census tracts have installed 69% less rooftop solar than no majority tracts of exact same household incomes. Since 2006, 90% of electric vehicle home income credits were received by the top income quintile. And only about 10% of people that live with multiple disabilities have access to paratransit. They live in paratransit deserts. They cannot get around. The engineering community needs to grapple with the fact that there is a foundational gap in understanding what these gaps are in equitable access to our energy system. Engineers need to recognize the needs of people by their demographics, by their age, by their race, their health, their poverty levels, understand the interactions of those needs, how they might compound or be cumulative over time. And then those technologies in the clean energy system, they will need to be designed to be safer and to support people's well-being across the entire life cycle. And engineers will also need to recognize the procedural limitations of energy system decision making, because often that is what actually impacts what is in people's buildings. Energy equity is a relatively new concept. Certainly it's new to engineers, but it recognizes that disadvantaged communities have been historically marginalized and overburdened by pollution and underinvestment in clean energy technologies. They do not have access historically to energy efficient housing or energy efficient transportation. And an equitable energy system is one in which the economic, the health, and the social benefits of participating in all level of, I'm sorry, of those benefits extend to all levels of society, regardless of someone's ability, their race, or their socioeconomic status. And achieving energy equity requires an engineer's intentionally designed systems and technologies and procedures and policies that will lead to the fair and the just distribution of benefits in the energy system. And it is only through the goal of achieving energy equity that we can actually possibly achieve our societal goal of full decarbonization. Because that requires that these technologies reach all people. That is a very lofty and challenging goal. So the federal government not only has a goal to fully decarbonize by 2050, but they've laid out a strategy to do it that in many cases is technologically feasible. It's built upon three principles. The first is that you decarbonize electricity and the energy supply. The second is that you use electrification and energy efficiency to decarbonize end uses. So that means you're electrifying your cars, your buildings, and the industrial sector. And then finally, for the sake of completeness around this strategy, I will not talk about this, 
It is to enhance the carbon storage potential in natural systems. So I will be talking about that central pillar, specifically the decarbonization of buildings. It is a critically important sector for decarbonization and is much more challenging than people realize. The Rhodium Group has done analysis to show that, oh, oh, <laughs> I didn't realize I went ahead. Sorry. Um, the Rhodium Group has done analysis to show that in 2022, our emissions went up in the United States by 1.3%, and that is the second year in the row that has happened. In the electric power system, the energy supply has actually had emissions go down. It's outside of the power sector where emissions have gone up. And the single biggest area where emissions have gone up is directly using fossil fuel in buildings. That's combustion in, in homes. So your heating systems, your water he heating systems. That went up by 6%. It is the only sector that went up to pre-pandemic levels. So the building sector is very, very important for that reason. It's important to our decarbonization agenda, but it is also important to the human experience. Americans spend 90% of their time indoors. 75% of our electricity is used in buildings. It accounts for 36% of our CO2 emissions. Americans consume more primary energy in buildings than any other sector, including transportation. It's in buildings. And if you look at that energy in that pie chart, you see that 55% of it is electricity. That's a lot. But it's that other 45% that is coming from combusting something in your home. That's your decarbonization opportunity. So that combustion homes, it's important for other reasons too. So we've all seen this in the news. I'm not going to talk about gas stoves today. Although if you wanna talk about gas stoves, we can talk about that in Q and A. Um, but combustion in homes is really important um, from a decarbonization perspective, but also because of the impacts it has on people's health. People who are susceptible to the adverse impacts of pollution, the very young, the very old, people with cardiovascular disease, they spend more time indoors than the average person. And the indoor concentration of pollutants is two to five times higher than what you see in outdoor conditions. Combustion indoors produces gases like carbon monoxide, produces particulate matter that will impact the development and the worsening of asthma. And there's a disproportionate burden in asthma rates in the US, particularly amongst children. African-American children and children of Puerto Rican descent have a disproportionately higher asthma rate compared to their peers that are white, from other Hispanic groups or Asian. And that's even after scientists have eliminated the influence of other variables. It it's really is important to the human well-being. And so because of that decarbonization work, because of the impacts for people's health, heat pumps, that is what I'm going to talk today, about today, not gas stoves, heat pumps. Heat pumps are having a moment. I've worked in building technologies for a lot of years, and I cannot believe how much excitement there is around the modest heat pump technology. So if you go onto YouTube, you will see that this nonprofit, Rewiring America, recently did a campaign called Mr. Heat Pump Goes to DC. Check it out. It's fun. They go and they talk to the director of the Office of Science and Technology of Policy, Sally Benson. They talk to senators. But heat pumps are really important and they're really exciting. Heat pumps can deliver efficient heating and cooling to your home, both both heating and cooling, and when they're properly installed, they can provide three times more heat energy than electrical energy they can consume. They are highly energy efficient. And this is possible because heat is being transferred rather than converted from a fuel like it is in a combustion heating system. Air source heat pumps are not new. They have been used for many years in nearly all parts of the United States, except in areas that experience extended periods of sub-freezing temperatures and the very cold climates. But recently, because of engineers, there have been advances in this technology. And cold climate heat pumps now provide a legitimate space heating alternative in these cold regions. And that is an incredibly big deal. In 2022, for the, not for the first time, because 2020 was an anomaly, but in 2022, heat pump sales exceeded gas furnace sales. And this is very, very meaningful to achieving those decarbonization goals. A recent study in energy policy by researchers at UC Davis, they show the first detailed emissions forecast for operating either a heat pump or a gas furnace 
in residential heating in homes across the US for 15 years. And this showed that if you go everywhere from the generation source down to the buildings where these pieces of equipment are operated, and you count for all the different emissions that come from that system, you can get a 53 to a 67% reduction in a 20-year global warming potential. Over that, and those emission savings are going to increase over time. That range depends on a lot of things. Old homes, those are great ones to replace. There are huge emissions opportunities, savings opportunities there. It's also really important in regions like the Pacific Northwest, where there's a lot of clean electricity. You see that more and more here in California. And you see it globally, too. The International Energy Agency estimates that an air source heat pump can supply 90% of the global space and water heating needs with lower CO2 emissions than gas boilers. So if you look at this map, it's those green and the blue regions. That's where you can have 50 to 100% emission savings opportunities by using a heat pump. And so I am super excited about heat pumps. They really are incredibly important. And very few people know what they are, but I really believe that you will. You'll know it when you're homeowners. You'll know it as engineers. But that's actually, I think, not the right question to ask. Because the right question to ask is how heat pump deployment actually impacts people's lives, individual people's lives. What does it look like in communities? So come with me to rural Alaska, to a small community called Cordova. So this is a beautiful picture of Cordova. Right now, home heating in Cordova, Alaska is provided primarily by heating oil. But the local utility has a goal to decarbonize. And cold climate heat pumps are at the center of their strategy. The community also has this large commercial fishery. That is the economic engine of this community. And it is a large load for electricity in that community. So as I said, Cordova is in rural Alaska. It is so isolated that the microgrid that that utility owns, it's member owned, it's not connected to any other lines or any other community. So all those homes need to be heated and that fishery needs to stay going for the economic well-being of that community. So my colleague, whose picture's up on this slide, Sam Rosenberg, he's doing a research study about how cold climate heat pumps are gonna work for this community. When they're paired with advanced controls, they can shift loads from a time where there's a lot of demand on that system to a time where there's less, and whether these technologies can actually deliver for the people in Cordova. Still underway, We've got the, we're collecting data right now. I love the example in Cordova because it highlights the central role that decarbonized buildings can play in people's economic well-being and their health impacts and many other things. But for the case of deploying heat pumps in communities like Cordova, it's really important that we understand those community needs. And it goes beyond what we might traditionally think about as the energy system. In reality, when we're talking about electrifying buildings and installing heat pumps, we get the biggest bang for our buck, I said earlier, if we go to retrofitting old buildings. That is really hard, it can be slow, and requires a lot of money up front. Most heat pump demonstrations are not like the one I just showed you in Cordova. They are in affluent communities. So we do not know how this technology will work in communities like Cordova. That's why we're up there. But in reality, in a lot of buildings, especially in ones that are underserved, they don't have proper insulation. So if you put that heat pump in there and you promise you will save people money with this energy efficient technology, if you don't have a well insulated building, that money will not come back to people. You will not be able to follow through with that. And what's worse, in those underserved communities that would benefit most from some of the health impact savings and the economic savings that could potentially come from heat pumps, they could also be affected by an unreliable energy system and an expensive power grid. The grid is really, really important to people's well-being. In fact, I would argue that grid planning is probably one of the most important things for, that we as engineers working in this space need to understand if we want to have an equitable energy system. Historically, grid planning has worked around the objectives of providing safe, reliable and affordable electricity to the customers. Those are those items there in blue. People know how to manage to those objectives. They've done it for years. But now we have new objectives, the ones in orange. Decarbonization, 
resilience to extreme weather, and equity. And it's these emerging objectives that are critical to consider when we're reimagining a paradigm around threats to our power system. The threat could be climate change. The threat could be cyber attacks. The threat could be inequality. It depends on the community that you're in. And each of those threats require a proactive response. So we have a research team led by Bethel Tarek Enke. She's focused on understanding specifically this most emerging objective of equity. Very few people who work in power plants or in power grid planning understand energy equity. And she's working to understand how customers or categories of customers will be affected differently and how we can plan our grid and our system accordingly so that the system will equitably distribute the benefits and also the burdens of services provided by the power grid. We're working really closely with the people that are actually making decisions on how to engineer the power grid. We're helping them understand what the right metrics are. And really, the most important thing to those decision makers is to understand the trade-offs between these different variables. So usually what we show them is something that looks like that spider graph down here with each of those objectives, and we have multiple different scenarios. I'm not going to show you a lot of spider graphs, but I wanted you to have a sense of what they're actually looking like, the people that are making decisions on the ground when they're trying to figure out what a community will look like. So I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here and make sure everyone knows enough about the power grid to understand some of the analysis we've done around these systems. So um, this is a map of the North American uh, transmission grid. We've got the Western Interconnect that's in red. Blue is the Eastern Interconnect. And ERCOT is down there in Texas. So I said this is transmission. You'll hear me talk about transmission and also distribution. Those refer to the different stages of carrying electricity over poles and wires to homes and businesses. And the primary distinction between the two is the voltage level that the electricity moves at. So you can think of the transmission system as being like an interstate highway. It moves a lot of electricity, bulk electricity, over long distances at very high voltages to substations that are closer to the demand for the electricity, like people's homes and their businesses. So you'd probably recognize transmission lines as these very, very large towers and poles that carry huge number of wires. Transmission lines typically move more than 100 kilovolts or so and above. So once those high from the transmission lines actually get reduced or stepped down to transformers, that's when they get sent through distribution lines to people's homes and to their businesses. So what I'm showing you here, this box, this is a prototypical feeder that we developed. It's an example. So it's a 300 node feeder that represents a suburban area, large suburban area on the west coast. We have 5.3 megawatts here. It serves 380 residential customers and 12 commercial customers. We have identified two disadvantaged communities in this analysis. We labeled them as DAC1 and DAC2. So that, this means that there are 130 customers that are in a disadvantaged community and 250 that are not. So we are not using the specific demographics of the community here to be able to determine whether or not they're disadvantaged. There are a lot of privacy issues that made that difficult in this project. So in this case, what we did is we assumed that DAC1 was disadvantaged because it's far away from the substation. The substation is down at the bottom there. Because it's far away from the substation, um, it just has a much less favorable profile for voltage. This is just a characteristic of, uh, of a feeder. And it's much more susceptible to there being resilience challenges having some sort of damage happen and your power would go out in a community that's far away. DAC2 has a smaller load. So the houses are smaller there. So we just make an assumption based on those physical characteristics of the feeder that these are disadvantaged communities for the purposes of understanding these trade-offs. So the first thing we did is a really simplified analysis to show which locations on this example feeder would be suitable for solar. And this was basically just due to where there would be voltage violations. So we'd go over voltage. This is called identifying the solar hosting capacity. And it showed that, as predicted, DAC1, which is far away from the substation, would have these resilience and these high voltage challenges. And you, it would not be suitable to solar. So that community could not have solar unless there were upgrades made to the system. It's instead the non-disadvantaged community, shown in green, where you would see solar, favorable solar installations. And this is based purely on the physical property of the feeder. 
So as I said earlier, disadvantaged communities adopt technologies in different ways than non-disadvantaged communities. A great example of that is electric vehicles. So I'm using electric vehicles here in this study. It could also be true for heat pumps. Those are just large electric loads. So in 2022, electric vehicles adoption, what do you think it is in non-disadvantaged communities, in affluent communities? What, what percentage of, um, of cars are EVs? Any guesses? 25, 25%. So knowing that, 25%, now I'm showing you there, the data's on here. So what do you think it is in uh, disadvantaged communities? By 5%, that's right. So we're assuming there's a 25% difference. So that's, that's just baseline. Remember, I'm, I'm just giving you some of the assumptions about what adoption will look like over time for this technology. The other thing that you know is that your base load is smaller in disadvantaged communities. Homes are smaller. They're conditioning less space. And they don't grow as quickly because they're not adopting these advanced technologies. So this is the assumption that we're making here around base loads. The base load is gonna be smaller for disadvantaged communities and it's not gonna rise as quickly. So what we did is we did an analysis for each year starting in 2024 to identify where there would be thermal violations in the transformer and the line conductors due to bringing on more electric vehicles. So we could use a business as usual assumption where, which I just showed you, that disadvantaged communities have less load to begin with and the load doesn't rise as quickly. And if you do that, you get these red dots and all the upgrades in the system would be in the non-disadvantaged reason, all of them. But if instead you change the way you did your assumption and you added the objective of having equity, you started to see the green dot, which is because they were getting more electric vehicles, they had a need for an upgrade in the system and there was value given to an upgrade in that system. But that happened by 2026, it continues into 2028 and into 2030. So what this analysis showed us, that is if we do our planning with these business as usual assumptions, where we just need to provide affordable, safe and reliable electricity without thinking about equity, all of the upgrades would go to the non-disadvantaged communities. They wouldn't need to put in technologies that would prevent those overvoltage violations. They wouldn't need to upgrade their assets for the new heat pumps or the new electric vehicles that would come online. That would be, those upgrades would, if they took place, would be limited to the non-disadvantaged communities. The disadvantaged communities don't get anything unless you intentionally build them into your system. And if that's the case, their lines are upgraded. They get voltage mitigation solutions. Things change. And they get the new clean energy technologies deliver, de delivering reliable service to their homes and to their businesses. But the other thing that, that means is that if you include equity, it's gonna cost more. It's gonna cost more upfront. And that is not the way the utilities have been planning. Over time, they're trying to reduce costs. But if you pay those costs because you value equity, these communities get financial benefits, they get health benefits, they get resilience benefits. But remember, these are the trade-offs the decision makers are trying to make. How do I think about equity knowing that the cost will be higher? How do I think about resilience knowing that the cost will be higher and where is the resilience going to be the most impactful to avoid? So if I had a different feeder, remember I just use this as an example, and different definitions in a disadvantaged community, we would have different solutions. So think about that community in Cordova, Alaska that has the acute fishery, that has all these new heat pumps coming online. You need to understand all those things when you're doing these analyses. And every community is gonna look different. And so you have to have engineers that not only can solve these technical problems, but are talking to people. And they're understanding what their needs are. And they're thinking about how you make these hard decisions and how you evaluate decision makers based on all of these factors. It's critical that we take the time to do all that. So in closing, I want to ask you all to, to think that way, to think about people when you're solving problems. Think about the considerations you need to make when you're looking at any new technology. I mean, I want you all to work on heat pumps, but I mean, that's just me. Um, it's, it's going to be important for clean energy technologies and for all the other technologies that people are thinking about too, to ask those hard questions. I really do believe 
that heat pumps are going to improve people's lives. They're going to improve people's health outcomes. They're going to decarbonize our energy system. I don't know how much and I don't know when, but I believe in heat pumps. But I also believe that none of those positive impacts are going to reach underserved communities if we don't work in partnership with them and we don't talk to them and we don't listen to them and perform really equity-aware engineering analyses around grid planning, about community operations, and think deeply about how these things work together. And engineers are also going to need to develop the next generation of technologies, because the majority of technologies, when you look into climate change analyses that will fully solve our decarbonization problem, they don't exist today. And so we need to be developing and deploying these technologies in a way that really understands and respects communities' goals from their energy system, and for all types of communities, not just the ones we're familiar with particularly those that have been marginalized and underserved. Thank you. I'm Noah, I'm a sophomore at Samoli Academy. And my question is, uh, is there other reasons why these disadvantaged communities are overlooked other than their financial situation? I mean, I think the short answer is yes. And I, I'm not gonna claim to be an expert on that. I mean, I, I really don't know all the answers for it. I mean, I think there are large systemic reasons. I mean, some of them are geographic, right? They're physically far away, oh, sorry. Uh, they're physically far away from where the energy system infrastructure is. Some of it is, I mean, some of it is um, systemic racism. Some of it is financial. I think all those things play together. I mean, they're intersectional connections. And actually, I would add that we don't actually, from the perspective of the energy system, we don't even know how you would define a disadvantaged community. And we just published this paper and asked people to give us feedback on how, from the perspective of the energy system, we should do that definition. So I'm giving you my own ex um, opinion, based partially as a professional and partially as a citizen. But I think that's a, that's a great question, and it's one that people are debating right now in the field. I hope that helps, Noah. Um, I'm Kara Coulter. I am a junior at Cabrillo High School. Um, how have different ethnic or racial backgrounds been affected by fossil fuels and homes? Has there been a significant difference between one community and another? Yeah, absolutely. So those asthma rate, the asthma rate data I showed you is at least partially tied to combustion in homes and particulate matter in homes. The detailed connection to that I think is still being researched in a pretty significant way. I said I wasn't going to talk about stoves, and I, I really don't know that much about gas stoves. Um, that's part of the reason for it. But one of the things that I, I have read is that what happens in homes with gas stoves very often is that they don't have proper insulation. So on very cold nights, people actually use their stove and their oven to heat the space. And that's when you get a lot of particulate matter coming into buildings. A lot of that happens in communities that have been underserved, that whose housing is not energy efficient, um, and have been marginalized from the broader energy system. And there are also issues with things like siting refineries and um, transportation systems and how transportation lines are laid to run through communities so that there are pollutions from cars that can impact people's health and well-being as well. But these are very complicated issues that are still being addressed. Hi, um, again, I'm Carl from Cabrillo High School, a senior. Um, anyways, um, there's without a doubt that there is um, benefits to ele electrification, but um, in regards to electric vehicles, um, how do you ensure that electrification is done in a sustainable and reliable manner, especially in regards to the um, lithium mining operations and their damaging effects to the environment? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I'm hoping, I'm, I might say I don't know to some aspect of everyone's question. My, I was telling the other presenters earlier, the best lesson I got from my dad professionally was to always say you don't know when you don't know. And I do not know the answer to your question. But I do know people are looking into it because it is a real challenge, both geopolitically and environmentally. 
There are a lot of advanced battery technologies that material scientists are looking into right now to be able to address exactly, exactly that issue. Um, I don't know how that will shake out. I'm not, I'm not an expert in battery chemistry. Um, but I think we'll need to weigh those pros and cons over time, and it could easily change as electric vehicle technology evolves and is, is more utilized. Hi, my name is Heaven Rojas from Samueli Academy, and I was just wondering, how did you get into your kind of field of work? I'm sorry, will you repeat that? How did you get into your kind of field of work? Oh, gosh. Um, there's a lot of luck that came into this for me. So I am actually a chemist by training. Um, I spent a lot of time in the lab through my PhD, and I transitioned to mechanical engineering as a postdoc. Um, I spent a lot of time studying um, heat transfer at that point, and, and heat and mass transfer are really critically important to understanding how building science works, how insulation can work, how um, you know different particulate matter and gases can flow through buildings. And you know, I, I had a lot of, I'll say guts, for lack of a better word, to try things that I had no technical experience in. And I was willing to not know a lot for a very long time. Um, I think those are some of the best career decisions that I made. Um, if I could go back and do it again, I would have studied buildings from day one. I love the work, but it's not how it happened for me. I didn't know that this was a career. Um, and so if you want to know how to be a building scientist, go into mechanical engineering would be my my first answer, um, but I don't think that needs to be what limits you. I think if you follow your heart and you have, take advantage of opportunities that sound interesting, even if you're scared, you're gonna go to good places. Uh, hi, my name's Michael, I go to Cabrillo High School, I'm a junior. I was wondering, instead of elect electrical cars or EV cars, um, Hydrogen cars are now coming out. Would that also be better in benefiting the emissions? Um, it depends on where you get your hydrogen from, right? Just like electricity, a lot of it comes down to, and the lithium battery question, right? A lot of it comes down to your source of your materials or your energy. So potentially, yes, potentially no. Um, ultimately, if you want carbon-free electricity, I'm sorry, if you want carbon-free hydrogen, you need a lot of carbon-free electricity, and that's gonna have significant impacts on the amount of electricity generation you need as well. The energy system is super complex. It might not be as complex as we are, per some of the stuff Caitlin said earlier, but it's pretty complex and interrelated. And so the answer is almost always, it depends. And in that case, I, I, I feel confident that that's, that's the right answer. Uh, hi, Andrew, Professor here again, but senior at Cabrillo, but can we use like alternate to like batteries, like nuclear batteries on like electric vehicles? Like nuclear, the, the batteries, the nuclear would be on the vehicle or on the power grid? Uh, any way. I, either, yeah. So you, there are a lot of alternative battery chemistries that are being evaluated right now. It's gonna come down to cost, right? I mean, the, the batteries we have right now have been engineered for cost reductions and the cars themselves have been engineered to be able to get to the point that we are right now. Adding a new chemistry in can really change that significantly. Um, and it's not to say that it could not be displaced, but it would change the auto industry quite a bit to change the battery chemistry as well. So over time, yes, I think we've got the batteries that we have right now for a while. Lithium ion will be with us for a little while. Okay. One last question. Um, my name is Adrian, a uh, senior at Cabrillo High School. And since the push to EV and lack of gas powered, like things like cars and all of them, do you think the US power grid will be able to accept the demand is gonna happen eventually? We need a lot more transmission, not today's grid. We need a lot of transmission. Transmission is really hard to cite and really hard to get online. I think we need uh, more flexible grid technologies at the distribution level and throughout. Um, we need a wartime effort to be able to meet our decarbonization goals that have been set up by the federal government. And a lot of that comes down to grid infrastructure. And the legislation that has been passed recently is gonna make a huge dent in that, um, but we need to move really, really quickly. I have a lot of actual anxiety around some of these equity problems 
because having these conversations and engaging with communities, it's not fast and it shouldn't be. But our climate crisis is here right now. And so I don't know how to weigh those trade-offs. I spent a lot of time thinking and worrying about it. Um, and that, that issue, though, that you brought up around the readiness of the power grid, we better get ready. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank one Thank you very much. Karma, you uh, illustrate two principles we should follow as engineers. One is to not only do great things, but do good things, right? Great and good. And uh, secondly, engineering now, as we move forward, really needs to work with social sciences to figure out what the right things are to do and how to handle different situations in communities. So thank you for, for doing, reminding us of that. Very good. I'd like to thank all four speakers. Let's give them a round of applause because they were fantastic. <laughs> And I, I, I just want to congratulate the students. Your, your, your preparation and questions are great and uh, just fantastic. And I, uh, I, and I thank you very much for your enthusiasm and the great work. So let's give the students a round of applause. Right? <laughs> and I'm declaring it a tie between Cabrillo and Samueli. OK, so it, you, you both did great. Um, and I want to also mention the mentors and teachers that are here. So important to this country and what you've done. And th we want to thank you for, for what you're doing with your students. Yeah? Now I ask Al to come up here and uh, Al Romig, our executive officer. And uh, he will, uh, by the way, Al Romig was uh, <coughs> in the frontiers of engineering in the very first class in 19, oh, I won't, I won't say what year. First class, OK? Come on up, Al. What a great time to be an engineer. Would you agree? Yeah, right. And I think, I hope what you heard today were the stories of four adventures, whether it's in space, dealing with anti, uh, antibiotic resistant microbial things, advanced manufacturing, decarbonizing the grid. And I think you heard, as, as John, in fact, just alluded again, that people are an important part of this. And if you want to succeed as an engineer, not only is it, as Bo said, not only is it math and science, but it's also being able to work with other people, teamwork. Engineering is a team sport, believe me. It's a team sport. You need to know how to work with people. And communication skills are absolutely in incredibly important. So since this stands between you and food, we will I'll make, make sure my remarks were brief. Uh, what I'd like to do, do now is, is have John and Don come up on stage. And I'd to, like to take a moment for us to recognize our speakers. And, and for the speakers, when I call your name, please come up to the stage to be recognized and then remain on the stage because at the end we'll take a group photo of everyone. And I would ask that you hold your applause until all four of them are up here. So everyone's on stage, everyone's on stage. Winter, Winter and Anderson take center stage. They did, got it. <laughs> all right, first one, Bo Nas. Bo Nas is hereby honored as recipient of the Gilbert Lectureship in recognition of outstanding contributions to the field of aerospace engineering and presentation of his lecture on design of space systems at the NAE 2023 national meeting. That's it. Just step the stage. Dr. Caitlin Howe. Dr. Caitlin Howell is hereby honored as recipient of the Gilbreth Lectureship in recognition of outstanding contributions to the field of bioengineering and presentation of her lecture on prevention of biofilm associated infections at the NAE 2023 national meeting. <laughs> Dr. Brian Post. 
Dr. Brian Post is hereby honored as recipient of the Gilbreth Lectureship in recognition of outstanding contributions to the field of additive manufacturing and presentation of his lecture on large-scale 3D printing of industrial materials at the NAE 2023 National Meeting. <laughs> Dr. Karma Sawyer. Dr. Karma Sawyer is hereby honored as recipient of the Gilbert Lectureship in recognition of outstanding contributions to the field of energy engineering and presentation of her lecture on equitable building decarbonization at the 2023 National Meeting. Each speaker here today has given us a glimpse into tomorrow, the tomorrow they are helping to create with your help. So let's have one final round of applause. How do you want to arrange for the group photo? You don't know the, yeah, the students can head off for the food if you like. We're going to take some group photos up here. <laughs>